Looks like we're good. I will officially call the meeting to order. Um, one quick thing, Arlene, before uh, we start the meeting, uh, two questions for you on um, Juneteenth. Yep. One, um, I mentioned to Larry that I thought we needed a proclamation. So yeah. if we just want to get in the details, you can work on that tomorrow. Um, okay. So we, like, we can pick it up. I can even pick it up. Yeah. Um, and then if you could also forward the finalized flyer to Larry, we can send out a blast. Okay. So those are my, those are my two follow-ups for you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Because I, I had contacting Larry about my, about the, the proclamation on my, didn't get completely done to do list for today. No worries. Yeah. That was, I, it was funny because I asked Larry if he got it. He was like, I don't know anything about it. So it was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we what, talked what? about it, Brian, you and I, yeah. so I definitely, yeah, it was on my list. Yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Um, but uh, all those good events moving forward, uh, we will move to the uh, 2022 capital budget review. And I'll turn it over to Larry and Brenda. And yeah. I think we also have the department heads if we need them. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually going to uh, I'm going to uh, promote them when we need them for for their departments. So, um, so thank you for uh, for meeting on this tonight. It's a this is a I was telling Brian before the meeting. It's a little bit a um, little bit different of a capital budget. Um, for those of you that went through it, you'll see that uh, the numbers are pretty big. Um, you know, it, it, but we think that, um, you know, we're doing our our best here to try to identify what we think um, the needs are around the village and, and you know, what that, what that might cost, frankly. Um, so that's what this whole exercise is about. Um, speaking of that, uh, for, I know Mitch and Arlene haven't been through the capital budget process um, this year, uh, this, or ever, I should say. Um, and so uh, just to, by way of explaining what this is all about. So um, for uh, projects and, and uh, expenditures that can la that are, first of all, too excessive to be paid for in one year, uh, or even projects that can't be completed within one year, um, we do not budget those projects as part of the operating budget, which is what you went through back in, in the spring. And uh, instead, we, we budget them in a separate process and, and try to make determinations about what projects need to be done and, and which ones, uh, and, and not only which ones have to be done, but when they're gonna be done. Um, and based on that, uh, we often will, uh, will borrow, um, borrow money to pay those projects off over time. Um, the amount of time that we pay it off, off over is not uh, something that we make up. It's something that the state uh, lays out in local finance law. Uh, so for example, you can't, uh, you can't borrow for a police car and pay that off over 20 years. Obviously the asset's not gonna be here in 20 years probably. Uh, on the other hand, you're, if you're you know, building a road or building a, putting a water line in, you don't need to pay that back in three years. You, you have you know, 20, sometimes 30, and even sometimes 40 years to pay back some of the larger projects. Obviously there's interest associated with that, but that's all part of what we, what we factor in as we talk about this. Um, the, other, uh, the other part of this that you'll, you'll get used to over time is the fact that we, uh, we break out our projects into uh, water projects and non-water projects, everything else. Um, obviously the, the non-water projects are the, are the bulk of what we have, but the water projects that we have, the reason we break it out is, is that the, the debt service uh, and the payments associated with those water projects are specifically charged back to the rate payers, not the taxpayers. So the, it gets factored into the water budget separately. Whereas all of the other things that you do in this village, whether it's buy a garbage truck or you know pave a road or whatever, all of those expenditures um, are paid for with debt service that's funded by the taxpayers. So we keep those separate and you'll see separate analyses here. We're probably gonna spend um, a much more significant amount of time on our non-water projects, although we do have a few water projects to go over as well. 
but the non-water projects, as you'll see, the, the numbers are um, quite different and uh, quite large. So, um, so with that, I thought, uh, let me, let me jump right in. We'll, we'll go through some of the departments um, to talk about some of the projects. And then after, after we're done talking about some of the projects, we can look at um, what it all means um, in the big picture, you know, what the, what the future debt service payments might be and what that impact that might have on its future tax rates, et cetera. Um, so with that, I think I'm going to jump on. Greg is, Greg Nielsen is on. Uh, I'm going to get him up here on the panel. And then I'll bring up his budget on the screen as well, just so you have, uh, has a chance to highlight some of the more significant items. Uh, Larry, before we launch into the individual departments, I just, when I was looking over the documents to prepare for the meeting, I, I wanted to ask one question that might seem silly, but I want to get my brain around it. So when you look at the um, projections for the existing and tentative projects for non-water debt service going forward, they're at, uh, at 2036, there's a huge like cliff where everything goes down. And I want to know, is that a reflection of time? In other words, you know, that the anticipation is that over time there'll be more things and that'll be built up? Or do we have a particularly heavy uh, project plan for the 20 years before, or 15 years, 10 years before that time flies? Um, and that's why it's all, I just was trying to get a handle as to why that cliff is there. Yeah, so so the 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 answer is is the latter of your your suggestions, which is um, it's really reflective of the current projects that we have scheduled out now, um, as well as some of the past year's projects, for which the debt is still out there, and um, and and the way when when we do issue the debt, um, it gets issued over a, a fixed window of time. So maybe the bonds are are twenty year bonds. So you'll see those payments uh, in the schedule for 20 years, and then on the 21st year, drop straight down. You know what I mean? Because the payments go away on that particular bond. Um, so, th but that's why that would happen. But what's gonna end up happening is uh, in, in our future years, as we continue on with this capital budgeting, as other projects arise, you know, 10, 15 years from now, they're gonna start filling in those, those gaps that are created. Um, and so that's, but that's what this whole exercise is about. So yes, that's, that's, nor that's fairly normal. Thank you. And that's, a good, that's a good question for sure. Yeah, yeah, no, and th that'll be interesting as we go through the, uh, uh, the debt service schedule and the, the graph that was in there, because you can really see it, um, how it plays out and, and what the impacts are gonna be. Um, um, for some reason, I'm not seeing Greg here now, but. Uh. He's on the panel now, that's why. Yeah, I see that, but why, I'm not sure why he's not popping up. Let me, uh, let me get him unmuted here. Can you hear me? Ah, there you go. Ah. Okay. Hey, Greg. Good. Hello. All right. Thanks for jumping on. So. I'm gonna pull up um, the uh, DPW uh, list of projects starting with this current fiscal year and then we have future years as well. Um, so uh, Greg, if you, wanna, if you wanna go through that, uh, let me pull it up on the screen here. Um, and actually before, so can you see that schedule? That's the 22, 23 year for DPW? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. So um, just a quick, uh, quick explanation here. So, um, and this will cover not just DPW, but other discussions as well. Um, we, uh, we go through an exercise of identifying the various projects that we believe need to be done and, and when we believe they, they need to be done. Um, and that, that identification process is done separately from uh, the decision process on how we actually finance it. So for example, uh, just because it's on this schedule doesn't mean we're going to borrow for it. Um, as you probably heard from the operating budget process, uh, we do have a fairly healthy fund balance at this point. It's a fund balance that uh, last year's board decided to uh, use some of that fund balance to uh, pay for some of the larger capital projects rather than borrowing. Um, we did that last year. Um, it looks like um, as Brenda had reported back in the in the spring, it still looks like 
our fund balance will be in a healthy position. Um, as we had, you know, as last fiscal year is, is wrapped up and all the books are closed on that. So, so we do believe that there's some projects that we're recommending that we not borrow for, uh, but instead fund them with, uh, with our fund balance, our, our balances on hand. So the way that's gonna happen is you'll see um, these projects that have to be bonded, the column is zero. Those are typically gonna be projects that are funded by fund balance. Occasionally there, there may be another uh, source of funding like this South Broadway sidewalk. That $50,000 project is 100% paid for with a state grant. So that's not a fund balance item. So that's the way these are gonna show up. Um, if you are worried about, um, if you're concerned about what the debt service levels look like in the future, when we get to that overall discussion, if you're trying to address the, those debt service levels, pulling out one of these projects that says zero here will have no impact on it because you're not planning, the, those schedules were done in a way that assumes that we're not borrowing for them already. Um, okay, so that's, um, that's the overview of it. Uh, Greg, I don't know if you wanna jump in. I know, um, I know you have one significant project in here that you wanna bring up, but if there's any others and if there's any questions, uh, certainly um, you know, Greg's here to answer them. Sorry, Larry, is it possible to blow up the document a little bit? I'm really having trouble seeing it even with my bifocals. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I might be able to do it even more, yeah. Okay. Okay. Greg, you want to touch on some of your projects? You, you can see yeah. that there, right? Uh, Larry, can oh. I, Larry, I'm sorry, can I ask you to shrink it just a little bit because it's being blocked off by my pictures? One ah, I got, I got you. Down. One more, no, one more bigger. <laughs> it's just right. Scratch me a little bit to the, scratch a little bit to the left and a little bit to the right. <laughs> Sorry, I can't help that's with that. Fi that's fine, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, Greg? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start with the VAC truck. Um, that, that's the most important project for the DPW. Um, our present truck is out for repair and it's uh i believe it's 14 years old and we're having trouble getting parts for it and um it is uh it's not in good shape and and the uh we definitely need a new back truck we have 650 catch basins that we clean um i believe i gave a uh uh, a um, worksheet uh, as to how we do this. And we have uh, in excess of 140 that we do uh, more than once because they're, they're very sensitive in storms. And um, although this truck is very expensive, it's $438,000 is, is the uh, proposal. The... Um, if, if we were to contract this out, uh, the, the way we price this with a reputable company, it would cost us $143,000 per year. So in, um, in three years, we could almost pay for this truck. And in four years, we definitely could pay for it. Um, the price... Deal is going yeah, I had asked um, I had asked Greg to do an analysis. <clears throat> I had asked Greg to do an analysis of you know to compare uh, purchasing the truck and staffing it with our own staff versus um, contracting the work out. Um, if Greg Greg gave you the raw numbers, if you if you dig in and really analyze it closely, the the um, the annual cost of uh, contracting it out is is about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars higher than than purchasing the equipment, financing it, and staffing it uh, in house. So uh, I think if it was a if it was a closer comparison, um, I may have been more of an advocate for contracting. Um, but the the difference is too is too large on an annual basis to justify it. It does seem uh, to make some sense to to purchase it in house and staff it in house. Um, like I said, by, by about $35,000 difference. And that includes 
uh, maintenance and and fuel and all that kind of stuff. So maintenance, maintenance, fuel, yeah, anticipated maintenance, fuel, and the cost of uh, labor to staff it and the cost of the debt service itself. So, yeah, we, we, we went all in on it and, and you know, tried to get, <laughs> essentially, we tried to skew the numbers to get them as close as possible so I could at least make the argument with Greg and I couldn't do it. So <laughs> that's, that's the best way I'll put it. I mean, I spoke to Greg about this also, and I, I mean, I think it, to me, it seemed given the numbers, um, just that even over like a three, four year period to contract it, that you would already have paid for that. And in the, I asked actually what the life of the truck was, and I think it's 15 years. So I think the numbers are pretty um, strong in favor of purchasing it rather than yep. contracting it out. Yep. Can I ask if the existing truck has any value? I know sometimes when we get a new fire truck, they the old fire truck goes out and then serves some other community and we get some value for that. Is there any value that we can get in return it for does. the existing truck? Or is it in such poor condition that it's uh, yeah. junk? It, the existing, the truck itself, uh, the, the, the chassis and the truck is in, is in uh, good shape. It's the uh, equipment that actually cleans the catch basins that is the the problem. We feel we could probably get about forty thousand for that truck uh, on gov deals. Yeah, that's our our auction site. Yeah, so there, there'll be a salvage value. We we may fine tune this number. Um, you know, when we get a better feel for what the salvage value is. So, so maybe the borrowing ends up being, you know, 410,000 or something, you know what I mean? It'll, we'll, we'll get it fine tuned. And how long is it going to take to get this truck? Is there a supply chain problem or a manufacturing problem? Or? Well, uh, it's, it, it's probably at least one year out and, uh, it could be longer. Um, I mean, it, it, ha it has happened in the past where we were told a year to two years that we got lucky and got, and got it early. But he, with with uh, you brought it up the supply chain the way it is, it, it's, uh, it's most likely a year out. But we do have to get it ordered. That's that's the problem. Like I said, the price of steel is is going up. Uh, Exponentially, it's every day. It seems to right. to go up. All right. Any other questions about that? Or, I mean, you're not. We're, we're not asking you. By the way, we're not asking you to make a decision on every individual item here. We just want you to have your questions answered, and then when you hear the whole picture, you know, after tonight, you can have time to think about it. And if you feel there's any places that need to be cut, you'll at least have the information, uh, or not cut. You know. Um, so Larry, can I ask on item five, is that the, the um, project that has a $200,000 grant and that's why we're funding 200,000? Correct. Yeah. So that, that this is the, uh, yeah, this is the, the pull off, drop off, pick off spot on, on South Astor Street adjacent to the train station um, that we've, uh, we, we have a $200,000 grant from New York State. Um, and part of that will also be to study the um, traffic flow in and around uh, Buckhouse Street. So that that's that was the uh, contract you approved at the last uh, last meeting. So that's what that is. Um, the si sidewalk repairs, I mean, I'll just tell you quickly, it, we, as you remember, we do have a significant amount of capital, what, what I call capital money on a recurring basis in the operating budget. We use, we're able to, uh, to set aside a, a good amount of money, I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head, it's probably upwards of close to $200,000 a year that you set aside for capital items. Um, we, uh, we add in on a periodic basis, additional money specific to sidewalks. Um, there's, a, there's a good amount of sidewalks. The DPW has done a study um, of the condition of sidewalks in various areas, and they have a, a plan for, uh, for repair on a regular basis. So this is kind of a, uh, uh, added in money uh, periodically. We don't we don't do sidewalk repair projects every single year out of with with brand new money like this. But this is one of the years that it's scheduled for, and you'll see it in future years as well. All right. 
Um, anything else about this? I can just, I can quickly run. I mean, this is obviously the most important because it's this, this year, but there are future years that we schedule out and you'll see uh, on pages like this um, where we have, you know, pretty significant projects out there. Um, yeah, I have, I have yeah. some questions and it always, I bring this up, which is, um, you know, we really start, uh, we're going to start needing to see some uh, real comparative costs of replacing these trucks like the pickup trucks uh, with uh, all electric or hybrid type uh, chassis. I think that in the time has come now that we really got to get some understanding, especially since there's so many manufacturers now who will be releasing them within, you know, there's already back orders for the Ford F-150, for instance. So I think it's now especially since these have a lifetime of, you know, maybe 10 years, let's say, maybe 12 years, whatever. I think it's time that we start really seeing a cost analysis of waiting to start to, uh, when, is, when is the breaking point that we start going uh, for uh, alternative fuel-based vehicles? I guess that's my point. Oh. For, for deep, and I know not all of them can be, but... Right. Uh, I'd like to answer that. The, um, the, the two trucks that are in th this year's capital budget, the satellite truck and the pickup truck, uh, the satellite truck is a workhorse that works every day, uh, every single day. And the pickup truck probably works four days out of five. But both of those trucks are used as plow trucks and they, they have to have the power to, to plow as of as of now as far as I know there are no um, alternative fuel vehicles that have the power to go out and, and plow the way we do so the f-150 is not capable of doing that you know that because someone has researched that or just because that's your feeling about it no no it's been researched they're, they're not powerful enough the, the batteries don't last long enough and, uh, I, I I don't. It's not powerful enough anyway. Yeah, it's a 150 class, which is which is not what we use for plowing, right? We we use. Well, well exactly. We're, we're those trucks. Both both of those trucks are 250s, and that this light truck is actually a six wheel vehicle. Right. But what, what we have we have done, and and I we've talked about this before, um, and and the board in fact passed a policy on this is that. Uh, we are continually evaluating each of the vehicles in our fleet, especially the ones that are in need of replacement. And if the, if the, for the job that they have to do, if there's a vehicle available that can perform that job function, we are purchasing electric. We have, we ordered um, last year. You mean um, you're purchasing hybrid? We're purchasing electric when they exist. So, you know, right now we have two, we've, we identified two vehicles, which we know can be replaced with, with electric and we've done it. Uh, one was the parking enforcement vehicle a number of years ago. And the other was the, one of the building department vehicles that was just purchased with a grant. So those, those have been done. We also put in orders for three of the F-150 Lightnings that you referred to. Um, those vehicles are not significantly more expensive than the regular uh, pickup trucks, and we identified um, three departments that we believe will be able to use them, two definitely and one possibly. Uh, one of them is in DPW. It's, it's going to replace a vehicle that doesn't do plowing and it doesn't need to be heavy duty. Um, the other is in the parts department, which is, again, also a, a not a heavy duty vehicle. Uh, and the third is still up for debate. Could be the it could be a function within the police department, believe it or not, um, or uh, it may be a second one in DPW. We still have to work that out. But we did place the orders, knowing that we're not going to get them for months, and we don't even have a delivery date on them. So, so we're act, we're actively doing all that. Um, but the okay. So you're also uh, two questions. Then I see here when you're talking about um, future years, there's pickup trucks that are priced at 40 to 45,000, are those considered to be the lower power units? No, um, that, be, uh, you know, that, that an F-150 could replace? No, those numbers need to be adjusted. Uh, we, used to, we used to be able to purchase a truck for that price, but 
no more. Uh, not with what's going on today. So is there any way to indicate in future releases of this, which with, with possibly an asterisk or something about, or which one is the plowing ones and which one are not, you know what I'm saying? Because it, it's, there's not enough information on this sheet without stopping and asking specific questions to know whether or not this is this can be replaceable or not, if you know what I'm saying. So sure. even, uh, even if yeah, we, it imprinted me, if, it's, if it said plowing or plow, you know, whatever, yeah. then we'd know that you required the higher performance unit. Right. We, we, yeah. we, we could adjust the 10-year the, the, the projection that we have uh, to, to show that. And also, uh, as the technology improves and uh, the, the, these trucks become powerful enough, uh, we we welcome the electric uh, trucks if, as, as long as they can job. Yeah, there, there's um, the the task of identifying which vehicles can be replaced and which ones can't is is not very difficult right now because there are only a small handful of vehicles within the DPW fleet that can be replaced with electric. Uh, because the vast majority of their fleet does plowing, uh, and then above the pickup trucks, of course, are the, are the you know the very large vehicles for which there aren't electric vehicles available. Um, the other departments are a little bit easier. You know, the parks department is much easier. Um, you know, certain vehicles in the police department were, are easy to replace, but but the public works, uh, because of the heavy duty nature of the of what they need to do, and the and. And by the way, the, practic the practicality of, of even if there was a vehicle that was electric that could have the power to plow, we'd have to make sure that we have a high speed charger because you can't be waiting eight hours for a vehicle to become available again during well, the middle of the storm. That was exactly my second point and I didn't get to, which is that, you know, ancillary to all of this, there seems like there's gonna be a requirement to get some um, high speed charging uh, down at yeah. DPW. If, if and when there, there are time sensitive, if there are vehicles that are time sensitive in terms of their charging, the answer is yes. But right now that's a very expensive proposition, as you know. Yeah. Um, you know but the high this speed is the capital budget, right? That's going out for 10 years, so. Well, sure, but yeah, but right now we don't have, we don't have that need. So we just use residential chargers at this point. So the, the final question just was, um, the satellite trucks themselves, what, tell me, are, are those considered heavy duty or is it just that, I mean, I know what they are. I just don't know. They're just not a, a special shell put on the back of a pickup truck. Yeah, well, there are Ford 250, which is a heavy duty truck. And um, like I said, there are six wheel vehicle to carry the weight that we do put on there. Cause when those things are built up with the, uh, was leaf bags or yard waste bags or or even filled with garbage they get heavy so uh like i said the satellite trucks are our uh workhorse trucks they also do you use them for plowing at all yes they okay. definitely them for plowing yeah yeah our fleet as you can tell our fleet has to go double duty we don't have we don't keep a yard full of uh dedicated plow trucks you know it's like like a state dot might so, so could we just jump through some of the future years and just look at some of the top numbers, like the next yeah, sure. going, I just wanted to understand, I mean, I think I understand everything, but, uh, you know, from a relative, but like the Broadway culverts, I mean, how large of a project are we speaking about there? Yeah, so th there's a, there's a couple of culverts that we've identified that go under Broadway that are, that are undersized. Um, one of them adjacent to Downingwood, one of them adjacent to uh, Harriman Road, under Harriman Road, um, and then uh, West Sunnyside. Um, those culverts are, and possibly uh, the, the one by Circle Drive. Um, those culverts right, are- That's what I was gonna ask you about, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So, the, you know, this, this project here is really only dealing with two of them. Um, we, we, put, we, ha we actually haven't settled on which two yet. Um, but we wanted to put the placeholder in here because we're we're trying to uh, we're trying to include this project specifically, and the reason there's only half being bonded is we're trying to include that in a grant application that's due at the end of July. 
um, the consolidated funding application with the state. There's a Climate Smart Communities grant that could pay a significant amount. We don't know how much yet and if we'd even be successful. Um, but you know, we wanted the placeholder to be there. So they're, they're extensive projects because of the utilities under Broadway, as you can imagine. And the downstream is, can handle the extra capacity at that point? In these cases, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's all, all of this is being worked on with our, with our engineer, with Han. Okay, great. Right. Is if we went to the major projects meeting, we'd hear some of that, or is this too far out for, for that guy? Yeah, no, we, we talk about this all the time. We, we just had our grant. We just had our grant writer Fiona into our meeting last week um, to get her prepared on which projects are on our radar screen so she can match them up with uh, potential grants. Right. I noticed under 2025, there's a 10 wheel dump truck, but that doesn't have a year purchase. So is this a second dump truck or third? Mm, no, it's probably just an oversight. This one here. Yeah, I was yeah. wondering what the lifespan of those dump trucks are. Yeah, truck, Greg, off the top of your head. If not, we can get back to you. But tw truck 27? Truck 27 is, I believe, that truck is almost 20 years old. That's why uh, we're scheduling that for a replacement. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just scanning down. I think the next large item if there was one more, maybe that caught my eye. Um, well, yeah, another large one, the Harriman Road drainage. What does that encompass? That's pretty far out anyways, but. You want to take that, Larry? You want me to take that one? Well, um, uh, which, <laughs> which year do you see that in? 2027. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I know there was a, you know, there's been a plan to increase a lot of the culverts, et cetera, going up Harriman, for, um, you know, yeah. in reverse sequence. But my question is, yeah. is this this project rolled up into one thing or is this so, just a fraction of that project? Well, so th this is what I would call, um, this is what I would call a placeholder. Um, okay, fine. I got it. it. That's fine. Yeah. I mean, it's because the... The problem with with uh, the drainage along Harriman Road and down into Station Road and down into uh, under Bridge Street properties is that there are a number of locations where the culverts are undersized. So while we may be having um, flooding issues up on Meadow Way, for example, um, you know we can't fix the flooding issues on Meadow Way until we fix some of the downstream problems. Um, and some of those pro projects are. Um, are really enormous. And so, you know, those projects are probably not getting done unless we have, um, unless we have assistance. And so that's where, you know, we're, we, we talk about this every couple of weeks at our projects meeting about how best to, to accomplish these projects, what money to go after. And we just think we have to start chipping away at it at some point, but the projects are very complicated for purposes of of our capital budget, there's really no way for me to, to, to schedule out, to map out the exact locations and how much they'll be and when they'll get done. So we really just wanted to put a placeholder in here just to acknowledge the fact that there's going to be money spent in the future. And, right. uh, you know, just to, just to recognize the problem. The impact though, I mean, I mean, obviously is 2027 is the highest uh, debt, uh, ceiling, shall we say, I don't know what the right word is, the highest yeah. debt amount on the chart. For, yeah. And so that's obviously reflecting the input of this. Uh, I want to call it a ghost project in a way that, you know, everyone knows it's needed, but no one knows exactly what it is to how to chop it up. Yeah, that's, that's our, that's clearly our issue. We, we um, you know, we, we, there, there was a lot of money available um, in the past six months or so um, through FEMA, um, which are which is money that's piggybacked on top of the uh, COVID disaster and the uh, Hurricane Ida that was pretty significant here. Um, that money would have been available for flood control projects, except for the fact that uh, we didn't, despite the fact that we have losses, 
our losses that have been incurred in this village did not meet the test anywhere near what the test would have been for FEMA to be able to fund this. Um, there were very significant losses down at Bridge Street Properties, but they don't happen very often. There are much more frequent losses up on Meadow Way, but they're not very big. And when you put it all together, it wasn't enough to even be able to apply um, for any of the work along Station Road and, and Harriman Road uh, and under Bridge Street. So, um, you know, we, it's, we have to start over and keep looking. That's why we're gonna, we're gonna try to look at some of those other Broadway culverts uh, for this Climate Smart Communities grant this year because that happens to be the correct size for the projects that we've, we've identified. Um, if we start tackling stuff along uh, Harriman Road and down by Bridge Street Properties, underneath the tracks, underneath Bridge Street, the culvert that goes under there, that's undersized as well. But the enormity of that project, I mean, that's probably a $3 million project alone. There are no grants that cover that for us at this stage. So yeah, we, we, that, that's why this is a placeholder. I, I don't, I, it's the only way we know how to deal with it realistically and not forget about it. Right, I'm just saying it has quite, it puts quite a shadow on the, on the uh, debt, that's all. You know, and yeah. it's five years out and it, I don't wanna say imaginary in the wrong terms. I mean, I think it's important, but it's, it's really an unknown. Yeah, yeah, agreed, agreed. Well, the fact that right. it's five years out means we wouldn't be funding it anyways at this point, so. Well, I don't, I'm not sure what you meant by that. Well, I mean, we wouldn't take out bonding for this kind of thing. It's not even a defined, uh, no. specified in any detail. So it's- No, not at all, no, not at all. This is really just for planning purposes. Um, the, uh, uh, the, and that's a good point that I probably um, could have emphasized in the beginning. The, um, although you'll be looking at this in total as a capital budget, um, just because you approve it as a capital budget, it doesn't mean we're locked into these, uh, these amounts and the borrowing for these projects. You, we really only would be borrowing for the, for the first year's projects. Um, future years, again, are just play, for planning purposes, but you can, you know, we can change course on those at any time. I think that's good to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll get into that when we really, uh, you know, start talking about what all this means when it comes together. All right. Thank you. And thank you, Greg, for your time on this. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions for Greg while he's on or? Good. No, but I think the, uh, the close out projects or the, you know, the near term projects all are pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. Yep. All right, um, let's, uh, let's jump into uh, Parks and Rec. I have Joe on. Let me get Greg back here. Okay, you guys have a good night. Thanks, Greg. Good night. Thanks, Greg. Take care. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Greg. All right. Wait for Joe to jump on here. Whoops, there we go. All right. There we go. Joe, you on? You want to unmute yourself and turn your camera on? Yes, sir. Yeah, there you go. All right. I had to put my ice cream away first. <laughs> We're jealous. All right. So, uh, Joe, thanks for jumping on. Um, well, you heard how we went through this with uh, with Greg for his department. So, um, I have your uh, pretty extensive uh, 22, 23 list here. We can look at that in the future year as well. Um, but if you want to run through some of the uh, some of the more significant projects or any questions that anyone has? Sure, um, the um, Matheson Park uh, stage design, um, 
is going to be uh, a great deal of work. We have a lot to take under consideration. Uh, Larry and I, I believe, are both extremely pleased with the company we're working with right now. Uh, we've met with them last week. Um, and it's, I think, going to be a great um, topper to what we've done at Matheson. And once we are able to finalize where it's going to be and how much space it's going to take up, it will free us up to then also determine what else we want to use or put in the northern end of the park to allow for more recreational opportunities for park users. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's one of the biggest ones there. Um, the next one, the dog park design, we've also been working with uh, Dr. Marilyn Glasser and uh, I've had several meetings with her at what we call Middle Park at Memorial, where we think we can get about a half an acre size of park for, uh, we'll have two sections, one for small dogs, one for large dogs. Um, we're waiting for an updated design based on uh, Marilyn's most recent visit, um, but she's considered one of the best in the country. She runs a company called Parks and Pastimes. She's designed dog parks all over the country. Um, and we think we can have a, a very viable project there, but we first want to uh, lock into all of the things that will need to come with it, how, how we will access it, how we will maintain it, how it will play in with the work that has to be done on the station road part of Memorial Park, which will be an enormous uh, project, uh, as you all know. So um, it's, it, it, it's a good project and I think it'll help to at least start addressing some of the concerns from the pro dog uh, residents. Um, number three is the basketball court at Scenic Hudson Park is over 20 years old. Um, it's really taken a beating over the years on the river. Don't forget, it's landfill, it's moved. We've had to patch it a lot. It really needs to be removed and then reset. And then while we're doing that on the piece of grass that is between the courts and the Eileen Fisher lot, we wanna put a multi-purpose blacktop area that would do things such as um, pickleball courts, volleyball, um, uh, and the one thing that I really want to try to pull off here is that it could be f uh, used for ice skating in the winter. It's the coldest place in Irvington. The way it would be designed, um, we might be able to berm it and get a nice frozen area down there. Um, you know, I think ice skating would be really cool. We've got the building there. We have bathrooms there. So it plays right in. So um, that would complete, you know, the, the, the project there. Um, number four is um, just to do some renovation work. The Memorial Park Fieldhouse was renovated over 25 years ago. It needs a little bit of tender care. We need to do some work in the bathrooms and we need to improve our storage on the inside. That's been a project that's been on the table for several years and we've kept bumping it back because we found something else that was a higher priority, uh, but I think it's time we get to it. Um, the next is the senior citizen HVAC. We are going through some real difficulties with the project in the senior center. Um, heating and air conditioning the building has become even more of a challenge than we thought. I'd actually like Larry to maybe comment on some of the struggles we're going through there and, and how we're addressing it. Yeah, so, so with the senior center, um, you know, there's been a number of either AC issues or heat issues. Um, right now we have oil heat and, uh, you know, electric uh, AC. Um, the what we're actively trying to do is, is uh, we're trying to figure out how to uh, replace those with heat pumps uh, that are much more efficient. Um, we're meeting, we actually have a meeting tomorrow morning to, to go over some of that. Um, but we also have a meeting next week with uh, the New York Power Authority that uh, we believe has a, um, 
some sort of a an incentive program for installation of heat pumps and we're hoping to be able to take advantage of that i don't know yet whether it's going to work um the bottom line is the solutions down there are far more expensive than we thought uh, we did borrow two hundred thousand dollars already we spent some money on design just trying to figure this all out um but we're going to need uh we're going to need more to make this this work now if it turns out that there are some generous incentives available, which I'm really crossing my fingers and hoping for, then uh, maybe we can reduce this a bit. But uh, on the assumption that uh, there are no incentives available, where this is what we would need at this point. Um, right now, just so you know, only one of the three condensers works in the building. We have no air conditioning working in the back part of the building or on the second floor. It's creating a real difficult situation. Our seniors are really not enjoying the heat down there. Uh, we're actually going to call to see if we can get a price to possibly uh, rent an air conditioner like you would use in an outdoor tent for a big event, big wedding or something like that. Um, Ed's come, tried a lot of things. We're waiting on some coils, which could help. We can't get them. Um, so th it's, it's a real struggle down there right now. And, um, the building, it, 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 this just needs to be done. We just have to figure out, as Larry said, the best way and the most efficient way to do it and, and fix the heating and the air conditioning. I mean, you go in there some days, it's 80 degrees, um, you know, and it, it, it's, it's hotter inside than outside. And, and then with the air conditioning, you know, you'll, you, you'll freeze in the front of the building and need a sweater. You walk in the back of the building and you think you're in a sweat box. So, um, and we've had more people look at it than I can even tell you. So, so we'll see what happens with it, but it is an important project. Uh, number five on the list, we're one of the three pickup trucks Larry mentioned in the first part of the meeting. I do have some concerns about the truck because there are times when we do need both of our vehicles to plow. Um, number one, if our main truck goes down, we wouldn't have a second truck to use for plowing. So we're going to put a plan in place with the DPW where when needed, one of their one of their trucks would be identified for us either as a second truck or a replacement of our first truck. And if that doesn't work, we may have to discuss with them the possibility of maybe taking some of the areas we're currently responsible for and seeing if they can pick them up with their plowing schedule. Um, and we're also happy to be getting one of the electric trucks. You know, we take great pride that we were one of the first movers in terms of bringing in the battery pack equipment up at the nature center. We now use a lot of that equipment in, the, in, in our regular parks also. So I think this is just another step in the right direction. Um, tennis court resurfacing for Memorial Park. Um, our courts, as I'm sure you know, are as heavily used as any courts in Westchester County. And it's simply just time again, they need to be resurfaced. They, they take a beating. Um, drainage repairs on scenic cuts in field one. Again, because of settlement, we, when we get, we're getting rain, we're getting huge uh, puddles build up uh, near home plate and the first base dug outside of the field. And it's gonna require doing, uh, digging up a big part of the infield, putting some better drainage in and then redoing the field from there. That's another project that's been pushed back several years also. Uh, and then the last thing, for any of you who've walked down at Scenic Hudson Park, you, you realize that the tree roots create an, an enormous problem with the uh, blacktop pathways. When we built the park, because there was only three feet of uh, room between the top of the park and the clay liner that's there, they had to pick trees that grew sideways and not down deep. And the problem as they grow sideways and the trees stay healthy is they're uprooting. They raise the blacktop. So we try to knock off a few sections at a time. We take the ones that are the most dangerous and we start replacing them. That requires digging up a section of the blacktop. It requires cutting the roots that are underneath that part of the blacktop and then pouring it and putting it back in. Um, we've probably over the past 10 years done about 15 sections of the park. 
So it, it, it's an ongoing uh, uh, project for us. So that's the coming year. It, it's, it's a busy year. There's a lot there. Um, you know, again, it's, uh, it's just needed. And, and if you were down at um, either park on Saturday of this past weekend, you, you, would, you would see the, the use that the park is getting. Um, this past weekend, even with the original call for bad weather, was the highest number of uh, group requests we've had since Matheson opened last year. And there, there's a lot more coming up. There'll be a lot of unhappy people this week because the park will not be open on Friday and Saturday because of graduation. It will open sometime on Saturday. We just don't know what time it'll open. So, um, so again, we're, we're, the parks are pretty heavily used. In, in the following year, uh, we hope to be ready to go and put the shovel in the ground. Uh, use the design work we'll do in year one to, to put the stage in. Same thing for the dog park and uh, the same thing for the scenic huts in court construction. So, you know, a lot of planning this year and a lot of uh, construction work next year. The storage building at, at Matheson, which is in for 24 25, um, I think that's a little too far out to waste anybody's time on right now. Happy to answer any questions that you may have. Joe, Larry, I have a question. Um, what I don't see, and again, I'm not looking to add more, more projects to you guys, but I know that you've been looking, and Joe mentioned earlier, the repair to the Station Road playground and uh, drainage areas there. And I don't see that project anywhere in, in this, this listing. Back. So yeah, so that that's mine. So um, <clears throat> that damage was caused by that. Um, we don't know for sure, but we are currently going on the assumption that FEMA will pay for all or most of that. Well, not all, but a good portion of it uh, should be paid for by FEMA. Um, that I can't say with 100% certainty yet because they've not yet approve the scope of our project. Um, if and when that happens, um, we, may, we may need to come, uh, we, may, we may need to come to you if, if they in fact don't cover what we expect them to cover. So with that level of uncertainty, we didn't even decide to put a placeholder in there for that. Um, you could make the argument that we should have, but uh, I think we need to let that one play out a bit. Um, we have a strong case for that that, you know, all of that damage that was incurred, um, you know, was as a result of Ida. So we've, we've, we have to let it play out. What's important for, for everyone to, right, what's important for everyone to realize, because I'm sure you'll hear from residents, we can't open that part of the park. I mean, as of two weeks ago, additional sinkholes developed um, in the area that's currently fenced off because of the collapsing going on underneath. Um, so to let people in there just doesn't make any sense. Some of the, um, some of the area where the pipe has collapsed uh, is directly underneath a part of the playground. So people look at it, they don't see anything happening and they, they don't understand, but there's, there's really not much we can do. The one good thing that's come out of all the time and energy we've put in is it did look like there was a time where the playground may have have to have been lifted and moved over, but it does appear now with working with our engineer and staff that the playground can stay right where it is. Um, and then we would fill the, the gaps underneath it to, to make them solid and new pipe would be laid actually right through where the current uh, splash pad is. And we will lose that with the renovation that's coming. So the other thing that gets kind of hard is uh, until probably for, within the next two weeks, well, when we get some reinforcements in, in our, our summer parks help, um, it's impossible to keep up with maintenance in the parks right now. Um, as you can imagine, just getting ready for graduation on Saturday is an enormous pressure on us. So I can't really assign people to go to Station Road and, and keep it, you know, trimmed down to the proper level 
and work around all the fencing that's there when it's an area that we're really not even letting people use. So it's not because we don't want to get there and get it cut. It's just that we don't have the manpower right now. Um, we lost five summer workers from last year, and we're basically replacing most of them with high school students who were waiting to get out of school. And, you know, it's great because kids came, we've got our own kids coming to us. The, the bad part about it is, is only one of the five has any experience. So they're all going to have to be trained um, from as simple a thing as using a weed whacker and making sure they have the right safety equipment on. So it's, it's gonna take, it's gonna be a, a, a bit of a tough summer maintaining everything and uh, we'll do the best we can, but we are very shorthanded. As you know, Scott Brennan will be out a year um, two weeks in two weeks, it'll actually be a, a year that we've been without Scott and we've been patchworking to get through. But um, skill levels, not, you know, what you hope when you replace them with young workers. Second question I have. Uh, uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, second yeah. question, maybe more for, for Brian than, than for Larry and Joe. But um I'm thinking back to 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 us committing a million dollars for for the theater, and like a week later, Brian came up with five hundred thousand dollars in grants. Um, you know, anything in the pipeline as far as the stage is concerned? I know when, when we originally had spoken about the Matheson Park stage back when we had discussions about whether the park you know should be open to the public or not, we had talked about the possibility of there being some outside funding for the stage. Any word on that? Um, well, first there was 600,000 to be a track, but 625 <laughs> really want to be accurate. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the answer is yes. Um, <clears throat> obviously this is, is you know, a year out, um, but I think once we have uh, plans, I will start my roadshow to try to drum up, uh, you know, money. Um, you know, it does seem that for the arts, there are uh, grants out there. Um, I would absolutely hit up our, you know, our local assembly person and uh, our state senator. Um, but, you know, I was I thought this might even be the one where I'd try to go for some federal money just because I feel like um, <clears throat> I feel like it'd be a real game changer for, you know, the, the arts in Irvington. You know, obviously we have we were, we're blessed to have a theater here. And to me, this is just such an unbelievable compliment to the theater um, and allows so much additional programming. Um, like it's almost like I, when I sit around and kind of brainstorm what we can use it for, it blows my mind. Um, so I, I hope to, you know, put some of that, some of those brainstorm thoughts to paper as well. But I think once we have that design, um, I definitely plan, I, I'd like to see, you know, get this entire piece kind of paid for, uh, through grants if we could. So. That's great to hear, you know, and again, I, I brought it up mostly because we're looking at some big numbers, you know, related yes. to to parks and rec in terms of, of bonding and, and expense. Yeah. And, you know, when you, when you compare something like a, a stage in Madison yeah. Park, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry, Larry, I think you broke up. No, no, no go ahead. I, I'm just saying that they're all, all you know, well-deserved. Um, Absolutely. And, and, and I think my thought we think, was. Think we could think in our mind that, that that million may not be a million for bonding. I think it might make it a little bit easier to, to think about committing the other, the other projects. Definitely. And, and, you know, to me, it's, there are certain things like, you know, say the fire department project that are, you know, near necessities. Um, you know, some of the, 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 the vac all truck for the DPW is a necessity. Obviously a stage in Matheson park. We haven't had one in our 120, 150 years. We can obviously live without it, but I do think it's, it's important enough that, you know, we can get grant money for it, but it might not be a necessity that we need to have, but it's a perfect project for me to get outside funding for, um, you know, it's because it's kind of above and beyond the, the usual needs of a municipality. So it, in, incidentally, and I know it's not uh, super significant, but um, you'll notice here on the, the stage design money, um, there's a there's actually a twenty five thousand dollar grant that's been earmarked uh from New York State through our assemblyman. So um, I know it's minor, but uh, it's it's a step in the right direction. And, and maybe for construction, it'll be more significant. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Can I, um, I guess I have a question about the stage also. Um, so the, 
And obviously, I, I guess I don't really know what a stage costs, but a million dollars seems like a huge amount of money. Um, is it just, is it a stage? Is it sound? Like what, what exactly is that? Because that just seems like an exorbitant amount of money for. It, it, a lot has to be taken into consideration because of where it's being put in the park. And we have to make sure that it's safe, that it's, uh, that it's going to have to be somewhat elevated especially if we're going to put electric electricity in it, we need to make sure things are high enough so that, you know, water coming into the park won't cause a problem. Um, it's, it's significant to build, um, you know, it's going to have a, a roof um, so that we, we can, we don't lose events. Um, it's going to be made most likely out of, out of stone and concrete and, um there won't be any, there's no frills actually. We don't even account for bathrooms or dressing rooms, but, but it, it's, it's expensive. And remember it's on landfill. Um, that area of the park where it's likely going to go is all fill from Yankee stadium. So in order to be able to get the foundation down, we're not sure if piles are even going to be needed. There's a lot of uncertainty. So we're, we're kind of, you know, figuring on the high side, and I'll use the word Larry used, we need a good placeholder because it will not be inexpensive. Now, don't forget, we, we also have the ability, once we start looking at design, if we think it's too much and we think we need to cut back, there'll be plenty of options there. But it's our job right now, if we're going to get something that can address the needs of, of the department, of the community, of the theater, um, that it's going to need to have some level of quality to it in order to host performances. Yeah, I think too, um, some of it is, I mean, we hope to have it as kind of almost plug and play as possible. So if there's, you know, an event on a Friday night, the lights will be there, the sound will be there. So everyone kind of plugs into it and theater lighting and theater sound systems are, you know, just overpriced is probably not the right term, but they're just expensive by, you know, design. So I think, I think, as Joe said, it's a bit of a placeholder. Well, as, we have, as we get the design, we'll probably have a much better number. Um, but, you know, to me, this was kind of, you know, a ballpark number that the kind of the theater, you know, that, you know, Greg Allen and, and um, his team kind of weighed in on some of it. Uh, Joe kind of had a preliminary discussions with the designer. Um, I'd like to think it's the high end, but we'll, we'll see. One thing, uh, regardless of, the, the cost, I just want to point out one critical factor is because the structure will be, is in a, in a uh, flood, critical flood zone, the design of it has to be such that it does not interfere with the flow of the water of the river when it's in flood mode. So that's a significant, you know, task to undertake and still have a functional uh, theater stage. Not that it would be operational during a flood, but the structure itself can impede the flow of the river at the time of, of floods. Yeah, and, and as, as you heard, we haven't, we haven't even started design. In fact, um, you haven't, first of all, you haven't approved the money for the design. And second of all, we haven't, you haven't even seen a contract for the design yet. We, we've seen a draft. Um, if the board is, is uh, interested in moving forward on this, we would, then put a contract in front of you and get working on design so that you can answer some of these questions. Um, then I have one other question. And again, this is probably that I just don't know what things cost, but um, $250,000 for a dog park. Is it me, but like, what is it that, I mean, other than like, let's say designing it, what would be in the dog, like it's fencing, right? Or is, what are we thinking? It's, it's fencing. It, you have to get water in there for the dogs. There's, there's a lot of fencing. There's then benches that go in, the material, you, you're going to try to maintain lawn, but you have no guarantee you'll be able to do that depending on how many dogs get in there. Um, but but it's, it's also going to be an awkward area. So building a entrance from the aqueduct into the park is going to be part of the cost. Uh, building a blind to make sure we protect the house that's on Station Road providing proper screening for them, um, which because I'm sure it won't be long before you're going to hear um, from them and maybe others on the street that they're not happy. That's what we might be considering there. 
and then getting people from Station Road entrance up to Middle Park or from Upper Park down. There, there's some significant work that will go into pathways and roadways. Uh, we have to be able to get trucks back there. Um, it's it things are expensive and. And we actually did have a little bit of um, an advantage because we went back and looked at a lot of the work we had done when years ago we got much further along and potentially were considering an area up behind the reservoir. And we actually had some, you know, we, we had some advanced design for that. It ended up getting um, tabled. So we've used a lot of that and we had done some pricing now obviously everything is different in terms of pricing in 2022 but we still think we had some we had some ideas of what it was going to take uh, cost us okay and then my other question about just about the dog park I, and i know that we haven't talked about this that much but um i don't know that the, a lot of the concerns that the residents have been bringing have have been necessarily about having a dog park but more the ability to bring dogs into the parks when they take their kids to the park. So I'm wondering if, you know, that resolve, you know, doesn't resolve that issue. Well, I know that our pack has not moved off their position in their letter. They sent you a while ago. If, and when that discussion is something the board desires, that'll be up to you. Um, for us, it comes down. We don't think there's a way to do it safely. And if you're gonna put a stage in there and you're gonna build other recreational things in the park, like volleyball courts and horseshoe pits, uh, dogs do complicate things. So, I mean, me personally, just as Joe, the superintendent, and I've looked at this and studied it and been all over the county. Um, I, I do not think with the park with one in way in and one way out, there's a safe way to allow dogs in the park and still use it for what you're currently using it for and are going to use it for. So Arlene, didn't we discuss at the last meeting that they're kind of moving on two tracks, you know, that we're going to keep trying to see what's possible at Matheson and at the same time provide a, a, a space in Memorial. So I didn't think it was meant, I never saw it as a replacement. I always saw it as, you yeah. know, uh, yeah. No, I don't see it as a replacement. I just think of it as, um, you know, when I, I think of us spending a lot of money on a dog park, I don't, I, I just don't know that like from the perspective of like what I've been hearing from residents that that's 100% what people mean when they, you know, are thinking about dogs in the park. All right. One I thing I, I, the one thing that I, 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 I don't really, this wasn't the discussion I'd hoped we'd have to have tonight, but in all due respect, our pack has spent hours and days and weeks of time looking at ways to do this and this is not a decision they reach frivolously the letter you got was well thought out and is the way they feel um, that doesn't mean you can't change it i will tell you i feel it will be almost impossible to keep the park safe if you allow dogs in the park during normal operating hours but this is a very complicated topic. It's not going to get solved in one night. You're going to need to have to dedicate a lot of time to it, and and you know, it, it you it, you know you you know it's your nickel. But you know we're going to let you know our position, and I've let you know mine. You know I think probably about fifty times in the past three years. Do, I don't know if people have people ever talked about scenic Hudson also. I mean, do you see the same? I, I guess I'm I'm going off topic here. I'm talking about dogs in the park yeah. and are, are I, the problem, just saying, right. Here's the issue. Numbers. Right. Um, so uh, you know, in terms of getting use of a park that unless you're working in the parks like we are, you don't see what happens. People already don't even follow the rules. They bring their dogs in. They don't pick up after them. Now, not everyone. There are wonderful dog owners. I'm a wonderful dog owner, okay? I take care of my dog. I take care of any place I bring it. But there are a lot of people who simply do not take care or pick up after their dogs. You know, I, I, I'll guarantee you, if you walk around Scenic Hudson Park, 
it, the chance is before you finish a loop, you'll see it somewhere if we haven't gotten in there to do our maintenance yet. Okay. They're ball fields. We've had people whose kids were come running up to their parents filled with it in their hands because they was on the grass. If people would follow rules, it would make the decision a little bit easier. People do not look at the woods, look at the trails. There is an enormous number of people who are dog owners who do not. And that's a hard thing to say because I have so many friends in Irvington who are dog owners and really care and really try to do the right thing. Unless you're going to keep guards on duty in these places, it's very hard to find a way to make this work. Go to the Dobbs Ferry Waterfront Park and look at the conditions. I don't mean to throw them under the bus, but they don't maintain it. They don't they don't have the maintenance we have. And, you know, people just bring dogs in. I mean, I, you know, I don't mean to interrupt, but I really think we should hold this for another meeting because right now we're not talking I about agree. any yeah. money spent on dog park design. It's already effectively allocated and dark dog park construction is at least a year out. So we have plenty of time to discuss even while the design is going on, we can discuss these issues in much greater detail. And I'd prefer to do that than to have an ad hoc discussion right now in the middle of a budget discussion when it's not a critical line item. That's just my opinion. I think, that, I think that's fine. And I think that's, uh, that's the end of the rec discussion, correct? All right. Um, yeah, unless you have any other. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'm distracted. Okay, I do have one thing that's been bugging me. Do we really think the cost of the design phase for the stage is going to be two hundred thousand? I mean, is yes. that? <laughs> we already have a proposal. Oh, okay. So you have a hard number. It includes borings. We have a hard number and, there. Yeah, it includes that, borings and geotechnical work. Yeah. So what comes out of that? Does an actual buildable document come out of it, or does that is that encompassed in the uh, in the ne in next year's budget? The 2003 budget. I, I believe the proposal gets us to um, to bid documents. documents. Yep, construction documents. So that's all in the design phase. Okay, so that explains the cost. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. Anything else for Joe? The most well-timed appearance of a cat in the history of any Zoom meeting ever. That the was my dog. dog. Oh, that, that was, was your dog. dog. That was my dog. That was oh. Buddy. Sorry, you're very little on that screen. See, it would have been perfect if it was the cat revealing he you. Was to be a well cat he was not well behaved, though. He was not well behaved. Oh well. There he is. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and now I see. You know, because when you're in this mode, the pictures are very small. So. Yeah. Hey, listen. Just one thing, and I appreciate how much hard, hard, hard your job is. I know we had the pleasure that Arlene and Mitch joined us at one of our regular department head meetings. I'd urge any of you who have a chance to pop in on one of our engineering meetings to just come in and, and, and see the documents we're working with and get such a better, clearer idea of all of the big projects that are ahead of us. Um, I, I've, I've learned more in the past three months since we've gone to this model of doing things than I did about the, the village in, in all my years together. So I'd urge you if you have a, an hour on a Thursday on one of the meetings to just pop in and join us, you won't be sorry you did. Do we have to rotate because no more than two of us are allowed there? Correct. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna coordinate that each, each, well, every two weeks or however often they're held, so great. Thank you everyone, have a good rest of the night. I'll be listening. <laughs> Lucky you, all right. Uh, let me, uh, we're going to jump over to water um, and then police and then I, and then we'll get to some wrap up and some larger discussions. Uh, some of the, some of the bigger projects I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, hold on one second here. That includes fire. Yes. <laughs> How did you guess? I'm like, Rip Van Winkle, I haven't been asleep for a hundred years or however long. <laughs> just like, yeah, there you go. All right. Just give me a second here. And
Jim, you want to unmute yourself or? There he is. Hold on a second. Jimmy, there. Ooh. Yeah, something's up here. His camera's on now, at least. No, I was. I thought he was planning a big, uh, a big entrance, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Riding on a water cannon <laughs> with lasers. Yeah, hold on one second. Let me, uh, let me see if I can talk to him a second, see what's going on. Sorry about that. We had a little mix up here. Let me just. Uh... Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So he's on. He's on twice. <laughs> we'll get him off of there. All right. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. So Jim's. Uh, Jim's got a pretty compact list um, that we can start going through here. Um, do you uh, do you want to run through your projects here, Jim? And and uh, sure. any questions? Uh, the Mountain Road Tank Emergency Power. Currently, all our facilities have or the ability to be powered by a generator. This is the last facility that we have, which is actually where our chemical feed. Uh, room is which feeds chlorine to our water system um is located and it's pretty old the inside the electrical panel is kind of like hacked into from old stuff so i want to clean that up and get it an emergency generator put there so um in case of you know the power goes out we could chlor you know run our chlorine and and all our charts and our our flow meters and um everything that we monitor the water system with. Then the River Riverview Road tank booster station. Um, currently, hydraulically to um, get the Riverview Road tank all the way full, you almost have to overfill Mountain Road uh, water tank. So we're, we're talking about putting a booster station in along the line to be able to send more water to Riverview Road and increase the, uh, the height of the tank, the water in the tank. That's for 2023-24. Um, Erie and Langdon, um, that stretch, we've had numerous water main breaks. Uh, the pipes are probably from about 1920 in that area. So I know within the 15 years I've been there, we've had probably about six on Erie and about six on Langdon. So I'd like to replace a section of that. Um, it's about 400,000 at current prices. And then Dowsling water line, just a reoccurring one. Um, we're waiting on the residents to get together to replace their part. And we agreed to run our line up to um, the aqueduct, which is our portion that we own. And just as a just a quick bit of a reminder here, um, the water line that is under El Retiro and a portion of Dow's Lane is is private. Um, it's not owned by the village water department. We do feed our water into it and then it goes to the residents, but the water line itself is private. 
um, a portion of Dow's Lane is public and which we would obviously replace at our expense. Um, the uh, latest, there has not been a discussion about the replacement of this line in probably three years. Um, prior to that, there were some issues with some of the private sections. And so uh, the way a project like this would work out if we, um, if we end up going forward with this is uh, the residents along that water line would pay a proportionate share of the cost of replacing the line. Um, and then once it's replaced and in working order, then the expectation is that the village would take it over as part of our water system. But we won't take it over at this point because of the, of the uh, very poor condition of the private lines. So this is a little bit of an unusual situation. I don't wanna talk about it now like it's, like it's something that's actively being worked on because it actually isn't. There hasn't been a discussion in at least three years that I can recall. Since the last um, time it broke. Yes, it's like, right, every time it breaks, we have a discussion. So, uh, so there's, there's, there's more to be discussed about this, but we just wanted to leave this as, as a, a bit of a placeholder um, to say that there is an issue out there that, that will eventually need, have to resolve itself. But it involves, um, you know, the special assessment of a, of a number of uh, homeowners along those roads. And so it's going to be a bit of a conversation that you, your board and the residents will have. Um, if it's going to go forward. But at this point, it's private. And if it breaks, the, the owners along the way there have to pay to repair it, it's essentially what's happening right now. So that's it. Um, I don't think we have anything else further. Yeah, no. Okay. So uh, one other quick thing about uh, some of the projects in the water department. So there are two uh, not listed on this sheet because they've already been borrowed for and already been planned. Um, there's two water main replacement projects that are in the works. One of them is, uh, I think, a, a, is it 1,000 feet or 2,000 feet? 2,000 feet, on, Mount feet on Mountain Road. Right. So very, uh, very difficult job, but that, that money has been borrowed. I'm not even sure if it's going to be enough at this point, but we actually had those plans completed, approved by the health department. And when we went out to bid, the... Uh, very real feedback that we got from the contractors was that they don't know when they can get the material, if they can get the material, like the, the water pipes, and, and if they can get it, when, when they can get it. And, uh, and as a result, they really have no reasonable way to price the job for us. Uh, so if they don't know, they don't know if they'll be working um, six weeks from now, six months from now or 18 months from now, they, they don't know. Um, so how do you price that job as a, as a contractor? So, and, and I'll give you the short answer to that question, which is you inflate the price because of all the unknowns. So we actually, uh, because of the supply chain issues related to water pipes, particularly, we actually pulled that job and are not, uh, are not, are no longer bidding it. We're going to wait, um, wait this one out a bit. It's not an emergency job. It's an important job, but it's not an emergency. Um, we, we're going to wait it out and, and we, we just don't think it's the right use of the village's money. And, um, and so that's, that's, an, that's for Mountain Road. And we have uh, the River Road, which is the uh, roadway that goes from, um, well, basically where MP Taverna is down to Cena Cuts and Park. That water line um, has had a lot of problems over the years. It's stabilized now. Jim's done a lot of uh, you know, work on it to try to isolate some sections and, and, and piece it together, but the line needs to be replaced. We submitted for a grant twice now, uh, and we were rejected in our grant applications. Um, we're not, uh, it's a, was the grants were targeted uh, primarily at disadvantaged communities and communities with lead led in their drinking water issues and we, and we were neither actually. So uh, that project we're ready to go out to bid for. We have money borrowed for that and we're not putting it out to bid because of the problems we had on Mountain Road. So um, those projects at some point in the future will be um, on the shelf, ready to go. Maybe there'll be a grant that we opportunistically can take advantage of. Uh, maybe not, but we have to wait until the, the supply chain issues resolve themselves. 
So, uh, so with that in mind, we're, we're also looking to do this Erie and Langdon water main replacement. Um, again, that's gonna take some design work, uh, but even if we had the money this year, we wouldn't be able to do it really. Um, it's just, there's no way to complete those types of jobs. That's it. Right now, the suppliers are saying pipes not available till February of 2023. So we might have some spring projects, but combined, we need about 4,000 feet of pipe and um, they're just not available. And the stuff for uh, River Road has to be a specially coated pipe and that's even harder to get. So, and if you were to get it, the prices are exorbitant right now. Yeah, even if we wanted to go out and, and even if we were able to locate some right now and, and say, let's say stockpile it, um, the prices that we'd be getting it at are, are really ridiculous. So it's, it's as I said, it's not an emergency, but it's, a, it's an important job, but we're, we're gonna let things settle out a little bit. So that's where we are on that. All right, anything for, anything for Jim? No? Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Jim. Have a nice night. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. All right. Let's bring in Frank. And there he is. Hello. Evening. Good evening. All right. So with that, thanks for joining us. Um, on the screen is uh, is are your items. Not not tremendously large, but if you want to run through uh, some of the more important ones, uh, or each one, whichever. Sure. Um, so the the major one we have going on this year is the replacement of our records management system, uh, which is currently Impact. We've been using Impact, I think, since around 1995. Uh, some years ago, it sold to another company, and the version we have is uh, is no longer supporting development, but also no longer supporting uh, the maintenance of the program. So um, it's going to come to an end at some point soon. Um, many other agencies in the county uh, were utilizing Impact as well. So um, some of the other agencies, along with uh, Irvington got together and um, there's been a committee on records management for about a year and a half, exploring, you know, some options as far as possibly doing some type of countywide records management system where uh, agencies could join at a uh, more cost effective approach. So um, we put out a uh, request for proposals. We've selected a vendor and are currently working on the scope of work for that project. Um, we haven't gone out on our own specifically to any vendors just to see what the cost would be for us, but other agencies have. Um, and agencies that are of similar size or slightly larger than ours uh, reported back that their contracts for um, records management uh, in the way of which way we would, would want to go or somewhere around the number we're putting up here or, or even higher. So our hope is um, that the county project um, comes to fruition and that uh, the cost is a little bit less than what we put up here for us to join it. Um, there is a possibility that that the county may pick up part of the tab for the first few years of the records management if it all works out that way, which would be even better. But um, at some point in the next year or so, we're going to have to make a move from our current system to, to a new system. Um, and then for next year, the, the only other larger project that we have is a police radio replacement, which is replacement of not just the hardware radios, but our whole radio infrastructure and switching over from uh, analog to a simulcast digital system, uh, which would work with the county as well as the other agencies in the area. Uh, currently, a lot of departments have upgraded their infrastructure and are running digital, and um, it's not compatible with us anymore. We're one of the last agencies that are running analog. And uh, just to catch up with times and be able to communicate with other agencies as well as with the county, we need to uh, upgrade our radio system. Seems pretty straightforward. <laughs> yeah. 
It was a little easier than some of the other departments, that's for sure. Anything? Okay. All right. Um, so I'm actually going to leave. I'm going to leave Frank up here on the screen on the panel. Um, I do want to run through some of the uh, larger, uh, larger issues to, to bring to your attention, and then and then kind of look at a summary um, to to let you know where all this where all this lands. Um, and then uh, obviously the next agenda item is uh, is Frank's as well. So um, anyway. Uh, I'm going to jump over to uh, to the elephant in the room, uh, the fire department. So, uh, and when I say fire department, I mean I, I didn't I didn't even ask Chief Billings to attend uh, as a volunteer. I didn't think it was necessary for him to jump on this. Uh, there's going to be plenty of um, meetings on this on this topic. So I'll just I'll just introduce the concept um, uh, and expand on it uh, a little bit or answer any questions you might have. But then. Uh, also know that we'll have plenty of uh, time in our upcoming meetings, uh, probably starting in September to talk about this uh, further. Um, so the, the single biggest project that we are planning for is a uh, renovation and expansion of our existing firehouse. Um, uh, as you know, the, the property to the west of the existing firehouse was purchased uh, by the board back in 2020. Um, and uh, the plan for that building is that it'll be raised and used as part of the firehouse expansion um, that you see in this capital budget. The, um, uh, the, the plan for the future, um, and this gets into some of the questions that have been raised by, by people associated with the theater, um, but the plan for the future here is, uh, is really to uh, design a facility that um, that could ultimately, uh, besides housing the fire department, besides housing the, um, the, the shooting range for the police department, for example, uh, to try to get that out from, uh, from where it is opposite the reservoir, um, besides housing those facilities, we also think that um, by further expanding um, the uh, firehouse, we can also encompass the village offices and uh, the justice court, and even the recreation department, um, you know, the offices and the and some of their programming space. Um, so it it leads to an ability to take the existing town hall building, and uh, with the exception of the police department on the first level, you can dedicate really the rest of the building to the theater, which then. Um, really uh, eliminates the need to create a, an alternate entrance, which I know was talked about prior to the pandemic and, and obviously was put on hold at that point for obvious reasons. Um, but you can do it in um, what we believe is a much more cost-effective way, uh, maybe a little bit more elegant in terms of dedicating uh, an entire, you know, an entire additional floor to the theater, meaning the, entr the entrance lobby and you know, potentially a new grand staircase up to the theater, and it really changes the experience of visiting the theater. Um, so those those are some of the ideas that we've been uh, we've been talking about, and 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 in you know the first step is really to deal with the firehouse. But the firehouse, uh, when we do dig into this, uh, the firehouse would be designed in such a way to be able to accommodate for those other uses um, down the road. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to do, uh, you know, thoughtful planning of these facilities. Um, we're trying not to just, uh, you know, address one particular need. We're trying to address um, some additional needs all at the same time. And, and uh, while it's expensive, we, I think if you, look at the, if you look at the different needs that are being addressed, I think um, it's very cost effective when it comes to dealing with um, a theater solution uh, when it comes to maybe um, uh, moving out of a, you know, a, a, a very old and, and uh, not terribly usable um, recreation department space uh, at 71 Main Street. So there's, there's ways of, of really consolidating and, and um, using space more effectively uh, rather than, you know, kind of cramming into old buildings, which is essentially what we're doing now. Um, so from a, 
you know, from a money standpoint, I'll show you that. I'm sure you've seen it when you flip through this, but this is clearly what's driving this capital budget, um, which is uh, the design uh, architectural work in year, in year one uh, or year zero, if you want to call it that, this year. Um, we'd really get working on, on design. Uh, and then you're talking about a three-year, 36-month project. Um, so there would be uh, three successive years of um, borrowings to coincide with the, with the construction. Uh, Four million in year one, three million in year two, and additional three million in year three. So um, again, these are obviously not fine-tuned numbers. Um, you know, we have an idea, uh, but without having done any of the architectural, you know, of course, none of them can be fine-tuned. Um, so from a timing standpoint, and this is where, you know, just so you have an idea of uh, what to expect, um, we, will, we will have a, um, a, a floor plan, um, some out exterior elevations, of a proposed design um, with money that the board already approved for this project. You, we did some initial schematic study of, uh, of the firehouse expansion, which you approved back in, I believe, December. And uh, the architect has, has put together, um, has analyzed the previous space requirements that, that the fire department needs going forward. They've assembled that into a floor plan um, they've, they've put it in in such a way where it can work with future expansion, whether it's town hall offices or a justice court or anything like that. Um, the mechanicals of the building will be, you know, designed in such a way to work together, you know, one elevator, for example, or, you know, one, one uh, HVAC system, that type of thing. Um, the, uh, the plan has been reviewed with the fire department. They have a, a, a building committee assembled and, and they've provided their feedback. Um, there's probably one more round of um, revisions. Um, and then we'll, we would like to get that design um, to you all uh, over the summer. Um, it will, uh, you know, not, not to be discussed at a public meeting at that point. We just want to get you the essentially a draft, if you will. Um, and then come September, we would like to, uh, we would hold a series of meetings, uh, however many it takes, um, to present the plan to, to you and to the public and, uh, and really start to understand what the future plans are, not just based upon what I'm telling you, but just to show to be able to present that to you and, and so you understand it. Um, and then, you know, at that point, we st you still haven't approved anything. You still haven't, even though this is in our capital budget here, um, you know, clearly there wouldn't be any um, any borrowing or any approval of anything until until you're satisfied with with what you've seen. Um, so I don't want you to think that because it's in this document that it's automatically approved. I just want to you know this document is again for planning purposes to show how it could be scheduled out if it were to go forward. But if you make a decision down the road that and and you know in hearing from the community, if you decide this is not going to go forward, you know then these projects go away. Um, but those conversations really start in September. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to start it over the summer, but uh, we'll, we'll get you the, the documents to look at so you can study up and understand it and maybe ask questions of us if you need any questions answered. And, uh, and then we can talk about it in, in September and, and after that. So that's when the fire department will clearly, you know, we'll, we'll get them involved in attending and they'll be able to answer your questions as well. Can I just a quick question? So the, the $12 million is the sort of the, the anticipated budget for building the firehouse, yeah. not the expansion. Correct. Okay. And yeah. then, and then um, assuming we'd have sort of parallel plans for the, like the building where the parks and, you know, whoever's moving, like, what would we, we do with those old buildings? You know, I, obviously we'd have to discuss what's going to happen there. Yeah, yeah, look, I mean, the, the the 86 Main Street, which is the building that we purchased that we currently own, um, the building immediately to the west of the firehouse, um, that building will be raised. The, the um, 
the, the residents that live there, the tenants that live there are aware of that. And um, the timing for that, again, assuming all of this goes forward as we've discussed, the timing for that would be the end of 2023. Um, we would at that point be also be ready with architectural plans and bid documents um, ready to bid out the firehouse, you know, the construction project, which would include demolition of the building. Um, so that's that's the timing. You know, if you, again, if I go, if I advance the timing a little bit further, um, you know, community discussion would be in the fall. Um, if the board, you know, approves going forward with it, we would uh, do the architectural and engineering work um, over the court, the remainder of 22 this year and into 23. Um, and then by the end of, by the end of 23, we would be ready with bid, bid documents uh, to go out to bid. Uh, and also by the end of 23, the, uh, the building uh, would be vacated and, and ready to be raised. And then construction from that point, you know, is, you're talking 36 months. All right. Any, so any other so my my general comment is I you know I think this is a perfect example of of how we've had a placeholder for this for I don't know how many years. Um, just as a number that's been out there, and this is the first time that you know when it's still a number that's out there over a period of years, but now it's become a little more specific because now there are a little more plans. So we I don't remember what the number was seven eight thousand dollars eight eight million dollars <laughs> that we had out you know, five yeah. or eight years from now. And it, yep. you know, it affected what, what the capital budget looked like in one way. But but this is going to be, a, you know, what we're looking at now is a more realistic of, a, you know, view of what it might look like over the next two or three years. Right. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's definitely putting a, a finer point on, um, on what we had known about for years. Um, and look, I mean, there are, like any project, um, especially one in that's uh, emergency services related, um, you know, there can be grant opportunities, there can be money to, to assist with this. We do have, um, we, you know, we, we very clearly want to incorporate, um, you know, clean energy and, and efficient building into this. We, we, we want solar panels, we want heat pump, we want potentially, uh, Geothermal, if it can be engineered properly, although that's it's pretty difficult with not a lot of real estate. Um, you know, it, the, the, all of that we want, and and all of that we want to seek out um, incentives and assistance with with all of that as well. So, um, you know, but there, but as an emergency service facility, it could also um, have the potential for uh, for for grant money. But you know, none of that. And we're ready to look for it, but none of it's been looked for yet. Of course, it's way too early. We don't even have a project approved yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't even, we don't even know if you're going to say yes <laughs> at some point. So um, anyway, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's, it's an interesting project. We're 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 actually excited for what it could for the flexibility it can give all of us in the future. It, um. So the first phase is the firehouse itself, but how does the rest of the the building has to grow upward from that? Is that the point? Uh, no, it would it would grow outward. It won't it won't be any taller than um, you know than than the initial firehouse facility. So it would it would uh, but it would grow outward to the west. I mean that's what the current thinking is. Which, by the way, we don't own that property, so that's that's a whole other community conversation. You mean the middle, the prep, the, the house in the middle? Yeah. And the owner knows what's going on, by the way. I mean, it's not, I'm not, it's not a secret, but the, the fact that there's a firehouse on the east side and there's an ambulance corps on the west side and he owns the property in the middle. So, you know, it's not, it's not a secret. By the way, this this and, and again, I don't I don't want to um, stretch too far out here. But one of the things to to keep in mind is that um, you know we when we think about these projects, 
um, internally anyway, um, we think about emergency services and right now they're, they're all volunteer. Um, and, and I'm incorporating Ambulance Corps into this discussion too. They're, they're uh, volunteer as well. Um, you know, there's, there's a possibility in the future that those, those services just volunteer. It may be some combination, including, um, including paid, you know, for example, a firehouse having paid drivers, uh, an ambulance corps with paid staff. Um, it may be that, you know, way down the future, maybe this, the, this doesn't become, maybe the ambulance corps isn't there and they just have a, a station for an ambulance. You know what I mean? Like not a full ambulance building. So maybe this does become more of an emergency services facility down the road, you know, with, with the ability to encompass, um, you know, a paid department uh, for a fire department, uh, or at least a partially paid department. And these are all conversations. We're not, they're, they're, we're talking about them, obviously, here at a public meeting. This is not a secret. We're just talking about good, solid planning for the future, not, not saying that something is going to happen or isn't going to happen. But we're just we we want to be prepared for that, and and you all should be wanting to be prepared for that, since that's one of your responsibilities is to provide the emergency services to the community. So, you know, we 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 think again, we think this in a lot of different dimensions. This offers a lot of flexibility. So th those are the types of things we'll we'll discuss in much more detail, um, but and very clearly in our in our meetings, you know, in September. Anything else on that? No, I mean, I think the only other thing I'll add is kind of historical context, <clears throat> excuse me, is that, you know, we looked at many locations before we kind of came back to this one as well. Um, and I actually think that the idea of potentially, you know, making it the little emergency services hub um, makes a lot of sense rather than just, just a one standalone building because it's one of those things where <clears throat> there are some the economies of scale. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll uh, we'll see that play out as the as the plans you know start to get hashed out. But um, it's, it's going to be an interesting project to see how it can develop for sure. Yep. Yeah, we have some you know, we have some good visuals for you to to take a look at and floor plans and things like that that you know will let you get more familiar with it and and obviously we'll put them out there um, you know for the public as well and present them and uh, you know we want people to understand what we're what we're proposing here and why, um, because they're going to need to know if this project does go forward, they need to know where their, where their tax money is going. And it's, you know, it's not, they're not small projects. All right. Um, so just as a, as a wrap up, I guess, uh, let me, let me try to, uh, bring up, uh, Brian's favorite page here, I think. So um, I like the Ukrainian color scheme. Yeah, it, it wasn't done intentionally, but that's that's a nice touch, I guess. Um, so as the uh, as the the legend says here, um, the the uh, the blue blue bars represent the existing debt service um, on an annual basis that we pay. Um, so currently, you know, our our uh, existing debt service for this year, for example, is. Uh, you know, somewhere on the order of uh, a million three or thereabouts. Um, the projects that were just shown to you on the uh, by the individual departments, as well as uh, the you know the large firehouse project, those projects, um, if they were all approved as presented, which obviously um, can change, um, in in the first year, which would be next fiscal year, so. You know, in terms of the mechanics of borrowing, um, if you can think of it, it's a little different than your home mortgage where you start paying the very next month. Um, in, in this case, if we borrow the money, let's say later this year, November, which is in the 2022-23 fiscal year, we wouldn't make a payment until exactly one year later, or well, maybe six months, but whatever. But the, we wouldn't make a payment until the next fiscal year. Um, so that would be 2023-24. Um, so anything you approve as projects right now, um, you don't need to make room for them in this year's budget, but you will need to make room for them in next year's budget. 
So any, so it's another way of saying anything that we, uh, you approve now um, has a direct impact on the tax rate for next year and for future years. So how much is that impact? And that's where, um, although the graph is, is pretty to look at, and you can see that there's uh, some additional debt service right here that takes it from about a million three up to a million six. Uh, and then the following year brings it up considerably higher uh, and so on. Um, if you want to see what exactly those numbers are, um, all you need to do is look at, um, th th this is the, the debt service, again, for non-water related projects, doesn't, has, none of those water projects are included in this. Um, the projects that are approved for this fiscal year would result in approximate, these are approximations, but they're, they've been pretty useful. Um, an additional $272,000 of debt service next year in next year's budget. So you would need to uh, add to your budget 272,000, which um, I don't have the, the budget directly in front of me. What's our, what's our levy these days? Tw is it 12 million, 13? Uh, you're muted, Brenda. Brenda, you're muted. I'm just logging in to get the exact number. I think it's a little more than, let me just get the number up. Yeah. So, I think it's only 13, I'm not sure somewhere there. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can see, you know, basically for every for every $130,000 roughly, um, that's, that's a 1% increase on the tax rate or 1% of our levy. Um, so this would be, just this alone would be a little bit over 2%. Um, just in the first year. Now the the the, the jump and the you know the the very first year that we would have a, a large borrowing for the firehouse um, and some of those other projects you heard about would add uh, an additional uh, six hundred thousand or so in debt service. Um, so again, that's you know that's a pretty considerable amount to absorb. Now, you know, there are ways of dealing with that. Um, you know, we, we still do have a, a fairly healthy fund balance. Um, you could make a decision in your budget process to um, help offset some of this debt, added debt service with um, using, with appropriating fund balance. There's limits to how much you can do because uh, as, as we learned during the budget process, if you, um, you know, one-time use of, of fund balance is not an issue, but if you're using fund balance to, to reduce your tax rate specifically, um, it's okay for the first year, but then the next year you either need to appropriate that same amount again, or you're going to have a big hole. So it gets really complicated when it comes to that, but there's, there's ways that we could probably soften this a little bit. We're, we're fortunate. Um, we're fortunate that we have a, a, a fund balance that's that's fairly healthy, and, and we could use some of that to uh, to try to smooth this out a little bit. I it's I, I hesitate using the word smooth because it's still going to be pretty rough, <laughs> but but I think you could you could probably make things a little bit better by using some fund balance um, judiciously and conservatively. Um, but the magnitude of these these are these are big numbers. You have a jump. Um, as you can see, as you can see on the screen, you have, uh, and actually this is, this is probably a, a better schedule to look at, which is the next page, um, the pro forma, which is really a combination of the existing debt service and the new debt service. Um, so you would, you would see from, uh, from this year, from, from uh, this current year, which is 22, 23, uh, for next year's budget, you need to add about $270,000 in debt service. From 24 to 25, you'd be adding about $610,000 in debt service. Um, from 25 to 26 would be 300, an additional $320,000. And, um, and from 26 to 27 would be an additional $190,000. And then things level out after that, finally. But, um, but that's, 
anyway, that's the that's the picture. Um, that's the sum total of all that we we talked about in the capital budget. And again, all of this assumes that every single thing you heard tonight is ultimately approved at the numbers that are there. We can make adjustments. Um, you can have time to think about this. We can come back together, you know, at, a, at the work session in, in July and try to drill down and see what um, see what things make the cut and what things don't. Any questions about that or? No, I mean, I guess I'm the only one that's going to be say that I'm a little bit freaked out about the uh, implications in terms of tax rate increases. And um, I'm not sure where the numbers are coming from that are going to you know, help uh, on the revenue side to help uh, uh, mitigate the impact of such spending. But, you know, we're getting into a sit situation where we're not quite sure where the, you know, when the inflation rates dropping, when, if there is going to be a recession next year, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm just a, very hesitant about uh, overspending moving forward without some better clarity of, you know, all the other economic forces that are outside of, you know, where we are today. Yep. I know oftentimes when you talk about like bigger governments like federal and state, they talk about the percentage of borrowing versus the size of the budget and everything. It would be it would be interesting to know what those num how that number would change throughout the years. I don't know if that's something that's easy. I don't want to give you guys too much work or whatever, but is that yeah, no, something we can, we can do that? Because I know that, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't pretend to be an expert on that, but I know that like that when you get to a certain point, that number starts to be unhealthy, you know what I mean? And uh, well, one of the, one of the measures that we're required to adhere to is um, they actually, there is a constitutional mm -hmm. debt limit that governments can take on. Now, obviously we're not trying to get to the limit. <laughs> it's not our goal is to get to a limit, but, um, but they, there is a formula that measures the uh, amount of debt in relation to the full value of all the property in the village. So the full value of all the real, all the, all the assessed valuations um, of all the property in the village. And that ratio, I think, I don't know what the limit is off the top of my head. Is it 2%? I, yeah. Or is that the tech? Yeah, well, I, whatever. Was I could look it up. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. We, we can... I could look it up. I have that in my office because I have this schedule I do every yeah. year for the. Um... No, we can we can report back on what all that is, but there are there are the... units of measure that we can measure against. Now, the level of debt that we currently carry, I believe, the last uh, bond rating that we had from Moody's, um, which we did get an up an, an upgrade during that. Um, their their comment was that the level of our debts was uh, was was good was solid you know it was not concerning we had you know very rapid payback of our debt um, you know I don't know this probably changes that a bit but I I I can't we'd have to look up what our limits are to see just how uh, how it looks in relation to the limit so we'll do that I, I think too another, thank you. Another, Interesting thing, Larry, would be if we look at some of our neighbors. I know Tarrytown did a lot of um, uh, capital expenditures in the last, say, five years. So we can see what, what it did to their indebtedness as well as their tax rates. Um, sure. You know, I'm not sure if, you know, I think, I know there's a, I think Ardsley's doing a, a fairly large DPW project, it's going to be $12 million. So see what it did to their debt as well. So we can kind yeah. of see, you know, kind of real world examples of this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What we, what interest rates are you using? I mean, I guess, you know, borrowing is getting more expensive. So I don't know if these reflect. Yeah, so I think I used, um, for, for these, I think I built in two and a half percent, which is probably still valid. That was, that was high for, for many years. You know, it was, it was overstated and overestimated for many years because we were borrowing at, you know, 1% or thereabouts. Uh, remember, these are tax exempt, so it's it's um, different than mortgage rates, for example. Um, so, but we should we're probably in the ballpark with the numbers that we have estimated here. Okay. Uh, Larry, I just looked up our debt limit, 
It's 7% um, of the average of five years of assessed value. It comes in right. at 123 million, over 123 million. So we're nowhere near our debt limit. Right, yeah, see the debt, we would be, we would be pushing up, and this is the number here to look at it, we would be pushing upwards of 25 million would be the top here. Right. With a debt limit of 100. 123,000, right. Million, yeah. Million, rather, yeah. 23 million. Correct. Right. So we would have exhausted about 20% of our debt limit, if you want to call it that. I, I still don't know how that helps in terms of the tax in, uh, impact on, on the residents. Well, it's two separate issues. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I agree with what Mark's concerned about 100%. I'm also concerned separately with the kind of idea of whether it's like a healthy Ratio. That's why I like Brian's idea of finding out like what the what the ratios are at, at our neighboring villages. Just yeah. that all that information just helps. Yeah. Yep. Fair enough. We can do that. All right. So it's certainly you know it it's part of a larger conversation, obviously. Um, and, and you know you always have the option, by the way, if you if you are supportive of the project, but you're concerned about um, the community support for the project, you, you can take a, a resolution, a bond resolution, like for a large project like the firehouse, and you could put it to mandatory referendum. You can put it to a vote of the community. Um, it's been done before here in Irvington, not in the recent past, but um, it was done for the, for the uh, Acquisition of the Westwood property, a three million dollar open space bond that was done, in, you know, twenty years ago, and it was done for the Burnham Building when you acquired the Burnham Building for the library thirty years ago. So there's, I mean, there's definitely ways to 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 vet this out and and uh, figure out how to go forward. All right. Anything else on this? Right. Larry, when do you think we could um, contemplate a, an authorization for bond resolutions? By August? Because there is, would be a waiting period. Um, our due date for rolling over our ban is the first week in December. And so there's ramp up for that. So if... Um, I, I think, yeah, I mean, What's the next steps for, for those that haven't gone through this before? The next steps is, is after you approve of this capital budget, then any of the projects that are listed in year one of the capital budget, so 2022, 20, this year, um, we would prepare resolutions that you'll pass that authorize the borrowing of that money. Now, you know, the one caveat, of course, is that there, there are the, the one large project, which is the $1 million for the design uh, for the firehouse, that one probably wouldn't be included in that because you still would have to have a further conversation in September, in the fall on that topic. Um, but the other projects, for example, if you approve of you know, the various projects you heard tonight, um, we would then prepare bond resolutions, which would authorize the treasurer to borrow the money. Um, and that, you know, ideally needs to be done by August, I think is what, what Brenda's saying, right? right. That's cutting it close yet. That's, yeah. that's yeah. Okay. So we're in that, in that period ballpark. is a permissive referendum for certain items, right? Yeah. Yeah. So then, and then we would, we would roll and go out to the market sometime in the beginning of December for, again, for those projects that are approved. All right. Anything else on that? Well, are you, um, I guess I'm getting distracted, but anyways, are you, what are you and Brenda doing that are going to help us give some visibility in terms of modeling potential tax rate impacts? So we will, uh, we will research um, at least some of our neighboring communities or similar communities um, and see uh, the level of debt that they have, the um, and what impact it may have had on the tax rate in recent years for their borrowings, um, because we know of a few large projects in some of the neighboring communities, and we think that'll be helpful. Um, well, isn't the tax rate really driven by, you know, revenues, tax revenues, and and expenditures? You know, so 
Well, you know, sure, but we can isolate, but but we can isolate what the impact of the debt service is, uh, and what you know, and and what that impact alone was. Well, you just told us it was basically uh, a one percent for every, uh, which is for every uh, twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, whatever the number is. Yeah. So, so that's what we're talking about. I mean, I don't know what there is to research. That's that's the impact number. The question is what do we look for financially on the horizon in terms of our revenue streams? And because I don't want to see a situation where we're moving forward, committed to all this stuff, where if people realize their taxes are going to be going up, you know, two, three, four percent in the next five years, no one's going to agree to it. Because the next couple of years are going to be very difficult for a lot of people uh, coming out of the, uh, you know, trying to, uh, on thread all the issues that have come out of the uh, post pandemic. So I, I just think we have to have a lot more ammunition than just saying, you know, kind of, ah, we don't know or trust us or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I do think that there's, I mean, there's so many, yes, the it's 130,000 is, is 1%, but if I got, I think the, the assessment numbers that just came out are gonna, you know, at least for next year, change the, the equation somewhat as well because the you know the overall pie got bigger um you know so i think there's there's and and we haven't taken on any of these projects because of that reason what i'm what i'm curious is, is how, how does Ardsley have a 16 million dollar project you know, that it's going to have 10 percent tax increases i doubt it you know so that's why that's why i think it's important mark to look at how other people have creatively i, know, I agree I, I think that i mean but i think we have to have you know both directions in terms yes, of I, agree. I think I think the easy thing is Larry can do is say that if everything goes through as proposed you know this would this would alone be a blank percent tax increase for each of the next say five years um, and then we can also look and see you know what creative things did Tarrytown do when they built the 20 million dollar new town hall you know yes they have a bigger budget than us but not that much bigger um, they also built I think three firehouses in the last 15 years you know how do they do that you know like it's it's hundreds of millions of dollars I think that they've spent, you know, so. Exactly. I wonder if they have a spare firehouse for us. Yeah, we could just, maybe we could borrow one. Yeah, it's a good idea. <laughs> maybe one of the ones that's 200 yards apart. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of unknowns here. So I think we can, we, before we vote on anything, we can, we can get some of those cleared up for sure. Okay. Fair enough. There might even be some grant money for a, for a firehouse, you know, like you know, federal grant money or something. Who knows? Yeah. So I, again, that that all that all should be explored for sure. That's why we brought our grant writer into our capital projects meeting, so she understands the the breadth of projects that we have. Great. Speaking of projects, should we move on to the next item? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do that. Um, we have. Uh, Thank you so much for the chief's patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me get the um, page up here. Hold on a second. Yeah. So moving on to the update on the recommendations from the plan for reform and reimagining of the Irvington Police Department. Basically an update. I don't think we've had an update since January, I believe. So I think it was January, right? Yeah. That's what my memory was. Um, okay, let me just get this up on the screen here. Okay, this was attached to the agenda, so I'm gonna follow along, but um, is that readable for everyone? Can I make it a little bigger? It's too small. I mean, I can look at the copy that you gave us, but it is too small on the screen. Um, Now is that, can you read that better? Yeah, that's definitely better, thanks. Okay. All right, well, I'll let, okay. uh, I'll let Frank run through this. Um, the Obviously the items that are highlighted, we have, uh, we have updates on. Uh, if there's anything else you have questions about, certainly just ask, but um, you know, we'll try to be uh, succinct about it anyway. Yep, so uh, the document that you see here is just what we use to kind of track our progress. And uh, I'm just gonna touch on the ones that are highlighted. And like Larry said, if you have any questions along the way, just stop me. Or if there's a question about an item I didn't touch on, uh, just let me know. Um, 
So starting off under training in officer wellness, increasing reoccurring in-service training on mental health, crisis intervention and de-escalation. Um, there's actually a class coming up in September for crisis intervention. It's the 40-hour uh, class at the police academy that we spoke about during police reform. So we have um, three people that are going to be going to that class, hopefully, which then makes about, I think, about 40% of our department certified in uh, crisis intervention uh, with the 40-week course. Um, Along the lines of mental health, uh, we recently trained eight officers on the new 911 mental health diversion program. This program is not fully rolled out yet, but uh, once it is, what's going to happen is if somebody calls 911, there's going to be a matrix we could follow. And in certain circumstances, um, they're going to be redirected to a mental health professional uh, instead of a police response, depending on uh, what they say and the questions that we ask them. So this is going to be a, a countywide program. Um, they rolled out training about a few months ago. So we're going to get everybody trained um, as the courses come out. And we're going to utilize that tool from our uh, 911 dispatch center. Um, and then I don't know if you've heard, but uh, the county is also rolling out mobile crisis teams again. Um, yeah. They're not up and running fully yet, but we're going to have a team dedicated in Greenberg that we could call upon to utilize uh, to assist us in response to a mental health crisis as well. Uh, moving on to uh, mandating wellness screening for officers involved in traumatic situations. Um, so it's very difficult to mandate something like this for an officer. Um, we run into a lot of issues as far as how, how do you define what's traumatic and, and for each officer. Um, it's also difficult to say, you know, who, who's going to do the screening and who's going to clear that person, you know, to return to work after the screening. But um, we understand that it is important that, you know, we can offer services to officers that go through traumatic incidents. So luckily it doesn't ha happen too frequently, but, um, you know, in the last year or so, we have had an incident where it was, uh, you know, fairly traumatic and a, a good number of officers responded to it. Um, so after the incident, we did offer optional services for counseling. Um, we, you know, I specifically approach each officer privately. Um, what I did was set up through the county's emergency services who has counseling available. They give us a phone number. It's completely confidential. And I pass that information along to each officer. Um, I would have no idea if they called. Uh, I don't even know if anybody called, to be honest with you, out of the, the people that were involved. So we make sure that, you know, after an incident that we might think traumatic, that we get that information out to everybody that was there so that if they do feel they need to call somebody and talk to them, they can. Um, and just in with not knowing what is traumatic to anybody, we also make sure that we keep information posted on our bulletin boards throughout the whole year for numbers to call, places to go for help if something's going on and, you know, whether it's your professional or personal life and you need somebody to talk to. So um, that's where we are with that section. <clears throat> Exploring uh, the development of a mentorship program. Uh, this is something that's kind of happening um, already, but it wasn't really written down in our policy. Um, new recruits or, or transfers go through FTO program. So they're assigned an FTO, which is their mentor during that time period. Once that time period's up, they're assigned to a, a sergeant or a supervisor who then becomes their immediate, you know, supervisor slash mentor. Um, and, it's, and it's for more than just, you know, asking regular work questions to that, that person's supposed to assist them uh, by giving them guidance, direction, and support to improve their overall job performance and satisfaction. Um, it just wasn't written down anywhere. So what we did was we um, changed a, the evaluation process and we added a section to include this mentorship kind of, you know, portion of it there. So that's actually written down in policy now that um, every officer will be assigned a supervisor slash mentor for the year that they can go to to discuss issues or, or talk about problems with. Um, mandating implicit bias in, in cultural competency training. So uh, that's part of the training that we started undergoing last year with procedural justice. Uh, every officer has been certified in, in the first course. It's a three course. There's three courses. Um, second course is coming out soon, which will enroll all the officers into that. And then we're also going to participate um, when it comes to fruition, the village's implicit bias program. Uh, me and Larry spoke about it uh, recently. 
Um, once that comes into play, we're also going to participate in, in that training as well. Moving to the next uh, subsection of safety and equipment, annual review of best practices for equipment, including new weapons. Uh, once again, something that occurs kind of naturally, but not formally written down. We're going to amend the uh, duties and responsibilities section of the manual so that it is uh, in writing that this is going to occur. Um, just for an example, right at this time, we're, we're exploring the use of new firearms that have uh, an additional and new sighting system on it. Um, we've spoke to a few vendors. They sent us samples of, of different sighting uh, mechanisms, different firearms and holsters and stuff. And we're doing some testing out on that equipment to see if uh, the improvements are, uh, are, are worth uh, looking into. Um, but by adding this information to our policy, that review is gonna happen on a more formal basis um, at certain intervals throughout the year. And this kind of same thing with the annual exploration of uh, other non-lethal weapons. Um, once again, it's something that happens, just hasn't been written in formal policy. So, you know, when we hear of new equipment, when we hear of new equipment, we research it and uh, go to demos. We take a look at it. We try to get our hands on it and see if it works for us here. Um, so what we'll do is begin uh, to maintain a file on that information and kind of just track what the, what the equipment is, you know, what we thought of it and uh, what the disposition was after we took a look at it. Um, installation of dashboard cameras. Um, so I, rec I received a quote from Axon, which is the same vendor that we use for our body-worn cameras. Um, the cameras for, for the vehicles would interface directly with our evidence.com um, dashboard and all video evidence then would be stored in the same location. So the, the program uh, that I looked at would place a forward-facing camera on each Mark patrol unit. And those cameras would activate in various situations depending on our settings, it could be based on speed, it could be based on if they put the lights on, it could be based on if there's a crash. Um, there's, there's various different settings that could trigger the camera to turn on or you could manually turn it on if you need to. Um, the program also has a rear passenger compartment camera. So that would videotape the uh, back seat of the police car for when you have somebody in the back seat of the police car. And that camera would go on the exact same time as the forward facing camera. And once again, all that video evidence would automatically load into our evidence.com uh, system that we use now for our body cameras. Um, <clears throat> developing new equipment guidelines. This is uh, once again, an ongoing process, just like when we got the body cameras, we developed guidelines and policy on that. Just as if we decide to go with the dash camera program, we'll develop guidelines and policy on how to utilize the dash cameras and, and train officers to use those as well. Complying with uh, New York State and DCGS guidelines. Um, and I think this was basically talking about uh, data that's collected or surveillance data. Um, any data that we do collect is subject to New York State uh, guidelines and DCGS guidelines. Uh, we're currently working on a um, policy for peaceful protest slash surveillance. That's gonna detail how any of the data that we collect is used, stored, or uh, retained in accordance with those guidelines. So um, that's just part of our process of updating our manual and part of the accreditation process. We're gonna address those uh, guidelines on that section. Uh, moving on to the uh, accountability uh, and evaluation section, reviewing the officer evaluation procedure. Uh, we've reviewed the procedure and made uh, two changes to that policy as far as the evaluation. We added two sections, which addresses leadership traits and community engagement. Uh, additionally to uh, the evaluation, we also added a form, which would be completed by the officer who is being evaluated, their supervisor, and the commanding officer of that uh, division. So in the past, um, officers were able to verbally give their feedback on, on their evaluations. This will give them an opportunity to give feedback on their evaluation in writing and that become a permanent uh, record of their evaluation because it will be attached to it. It also gives them a uh, ability to um, ask for a superior officer to check the evaluation if they don't agree with part of it and kind of gives them an opportunity to explore issues if they feel that it wasn't fair or 
it was an unjust evaluation. So once again, that form will become part of the record attached to evaluation and be made uh, part of the permanent record. And in, as far as seeking input into the evaluation process, all those changes I just spoke about, including the, the mentorship portion of the evaluation, I've given it to the PBA uh, to review and comment on it as you know, on behalf of the membership, just to see if there's any additional comments, questions, or concerns from the officers in regards to the evaluation process before we finalize any of the policy. Moving on to uh, policies and procedures uh, and accreditation. So I know the last update I think was in January. Uh, since then, I was able to attend uh, accreditation management class. It was a one-day class uh, along with Lieutenant Johnson and Sergeant Youth. Um, during that training, we learned about a team approach to uh, tackling accreditation. So we formulated a accreditation team comprised of uh, Lieutenant Johnson, uh, Sergeant Youth, and Officer Burnett, who's already a accreditation management trained. Um, so obviously, as everybody knows, part of the, the process is updating our manual to reflect all the proper standards uh, in the three categories of accreditation. But another part of it is creating assessments and proving that we're actually following those standards. So what our plan is as we're working through the manual is we're creating those assessments and putting proof together as we work through those, those sections and um, creating files for those each section separately, which is what accreditation wants. So instead of just going through the manual and updating it, and then once we're all done going back and now figuring out how are we proving that we do this part of the manual, we're gonna do it all at one time so that we're not duplicating duplicating work and, and you know making it a longer process than it needs to be. Um, once all that's done and we have all the standards and proofs and assessments ready, we're gonna uh, call for a, what they call a mock assessment, which is just basically, you get a few people from other agencies that are trained assessors will come in and perform an assessment to see how we would do on an accreditation assessment. Um, we're hopeful that by um, late fall or early winter of 23, we'll be ready for that mock assessment. Once we have that mock assessment, we could tweak and change the program uh, based on the feedback from the assessors, at which point we have to wait three months from the last change, and then we could call for the regular assessment. So that's our kind of timeline on the, on the accreditation program right now. Um, puts us optimistically at the end of 2023 to have the full assessment or at uh, the beginning of 2024 to have the full assessment from the state. Any questions on, on that part? Uh, and then going through the manual, uh, utilizing inclusive language as we work through it, we're uh, just trying to be mindful of using inclusive language throughout, making sure um, that we change things as we see it. Under community engagement, use of uh, walking and bicycle tours, we've, we've definitely increased our, our use of both of walking and bicycle tours, but more so probably the walking tours. Um, we create a new policy uh, where officers have to park their vehicles uh, get out and walk the area and the areas have to be, you know, a high likelihood of community engagement. So, you know, it's the parks, it's main street, it's, um, any, any events or venues in town that might be going on at the time they park, they get out, they walk and they talk to people last about 20 minutes to a half hour. Uh, we've been getting a lot of good feedback on that. Um, you know, we've had people just, just enjoy talking and meeting officers because it's different people every time. But we've also even had feedback of people that have voiced concerns and issues um, that they said they normally wouldn't have and or wouldn't have come to the police or called the police about. But since they were already engaged in conversation, they felt OK to, to share those issues with us. So it's actually been a very great program and uh, everybody's been enjoying that. Uh, catalog and publicize community events and programs. We've been doing a lot of updating to our website and we've added a section for community events and programs. Um, so under that section, you'll see just like a list of our community events, um, as well as all the police department programs. And we're also encouraging everybody to follow like social media for, you know, up-to-date uh, events and programs that might be coming up. Publicizing and continuing non-enforcement engagement with, uh, with youth. Uh, we recently got to participate in the Main Street School Health Fair. 
And uh, we hosted a booth in the gym uh, as well as we taught a class in one of the classrooms. Um, it was, our booth was very busy and popular in the gym. It was actually a little bit overwhelming. Uh, we were surrounded by kids the whole time and uh, they were having a really great time. And it was just, it was a nice event. Uh, you know, besides talking about health and wellness, we, we put them through kind of like a mock physical agility for the police academy where they were competing in push-ups and sit-ups. And it was, uh, it was really fun and the kids enjoyed it a lot. Uh, besides that, we also participated in the Touch a Truck Day at the library recently uh, and Bulldog Day at Memorial Park, where we handed out ice pops to all the kids at Memorial Park. So that was all, you know, that's all non-enforcement uh, engagement with the youth. And, you know, we posted all that stuff on our social media and we got a lot of positive feedback about that. Um, and additionally, as far as walking tours go, part of that policy that we created, officers are uh, visiting schools every day. They pick a school and they walk through it for about a half hour. They stop in classes, they talk to people, they meet teachers, they learn uh, the layout of their school. Uh, they get to learn the students and engage in conversation with students each day. And once again, a lot of positive feedback um, from the school, which has been a great partner, but a lot from the kids too. They, uh, they're they getting more and more comfortable with us, you know, being in the school and seeing us. And it's not so much, there's a cop here, what's going on, it's more, Hey, there's, you know, so-and-so let's go talk to him now. So it's been, it's been great. Uh, formal review of the IPD website. We've uh, been reviewing and updating a lot of information on the website. If you had a chance to see it recently, um, if not, and you get a chance, definitely check it out. Um, we update a lot of the information and added a large amount of new information and try to make it a little bit easier to navigate. Um, we've added new sections, like I said, programs and services. I've added uh, monthly statistics. Um, we started adding our policies and just some general information. And I'll touch on a couple of those uh, in a minute as well. Um, the next item uh, is creating an auxiliary police force. So I, I looked into the creation of the auxiliary police force and spoke with a lot of my counterparts uh, in the area. Um, it doesn't seem to be completely practical here uh, with, you know, in such a small village. Um, a lot of jurisdictions I spoke with that actually previously had auxiliary police no longer have them anymore. Um, only a few large agencies do. And, um, you know, even speaking with some of the local area counterparts, there wasn't a big interest in trying to start up a, a new auxiliary program, even in a, you know, in a, you know, group effort. Um, but what we can do, uh, what we have relationships with is Greenberg Police, who has an auxiliary police force, and Westchester County Police, who has their own auxiliary police force. Um, and we could assist members of the community interested in law enforcement careers uh, and put them in touch with the people over in those jurisdictions, and they could join the auxiliary police forces there if, uh, if they're interested in exploring that. Um, going on to data, transparency, and technology, uh, publishing the IPD manual. Uh, so we began to upload uh, some policy uh, through Power DMS, that program that we use now for our accreditation. Um, some forward-facing documents are up on our website already. It's only a few. Uh, we just started testing it out, but it's very easy to do. So as we get through sections that we're going to publish, uh, they'll be up there and you could click on one tab and you could explore, you know, the manual that's that's on the website now. <clears throat> Enhancing crime statistics. Uh, like I said before, we began to publish monthly statistics on our website. The statistics include arrests uh, broken down by classification, uh, blotters, cases, citations, impounds, juvenile contacts, medical cases, and accidents. Uh, it's it's kind of just some raw data that's shows kind of how our month was compared to how our year was. Um, part of our antiquated records management system is that we can't really pull out data or run reports the, you know, that really give you like a, a ton of information. So hopefully once we do switch over to a new records management system, we'll be able to put out some more statistics and, and data that's a little bit more useful to people that are interested in exploring that. And establishing a uh, policy for the use of business cards by police officers. Uh, we've established a formal policy for the use of business cards. I think most of you recently saw that um, in one of our videos. Um, not only do they have to hand business cards, it, the policy you know, makes them have to identify themselves by name as well as uh, the reason for the interaction. So uh, 
They hand out department issue cards at the end of any interaction uh, that doesn't result in an arrest or summons. Um, additionally, the cards have an area where the officers can write the blotter number down, which is the specific incident number uh, associated with that interaction. So uh, that program has been going pretty well as also. So, um, and that's it for the updates as far as what we have highlighted on the uh, on the spreadsheet. Um, if there's any questions about any of those, or if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I just wanted to comment that I was really impressed with how your department handled uh, that that complaint about that stop uh, and that that we saw the video on. I just thought that the way that all played out was, you know, very heartening to me as as a resident of the village. So, so thank you. Appreciate that. Although I will note that I think it's really weird that the police officer didn't know where Maple was. <laughs> It makes me think of how in London, I mentioned this to some of the trustees, how the cab drivers have to know where every street is in the entire city and everything. So maybe if we can do something to get the police officers more familiar, not all of them, I'm sure most of them do know it, you know, but, but that was such a small thing. Overall, it was such a positive thing and it just made me feel good. So thank you. I also just want to say thank you, Frank, because I, you know, having sat through um, the police review committee, I really appreciate um, how you've moved, you've continued to move things forward. I think it's, it's really important. I think it's important for our community as well. Um, so I just want to say um, thank you. And I know some of the things that were not even necessarily approved by the committee that you move forward, like the, the, the cards. Um, and then, you know, I think it, it's positive, right? We're seeing that a lot of these things are are just really, you know, positive changes. And maybe if people were nervous about, you know, police quote unquote police reform, that um, I think it's it's been an overall positive experience, and that it also includes um, many things for the police officers, right? Improvements for and allowing police officers to be able to do their job and supporting that. So, um, you know, so I really commend you and and the department on that moving this forward. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just follow up on that briefly to say that to me, um, the way this has, the only way this works well is when it comes from within and you have kind of buy-in from the leadership. And obviously you set the tone at the top, you have your lieutenants that are working on this. And I think the rank and file are all on board as well. Um, and I think the the fear that this was some kind of witch hunt is, is you know, kind of, I don't, and I don't think that came from the department. I think that was some, some residents outside. Um, but I feel like, you know, we, we can see now that we see the changes that are happening. I think, you know, I don't think anyone can say that any of these changes are negative or affecting the, our police. I think it's making everything better overall for everybody, both residents and, the, and you know, probably more so the, the police officers themselves. So, um, you know, and a lot of that is your leadership and your buy-in and, and, you know, especially taking over, you could have, you know, said, I need a year or two to figure things out or whatever, but you really hit the ground running. So we appreciate it. I know you've had a lot going on in your personal life as well. So, um, you know, and, and also, you know, the, the, our two lieutenants have done a really great job too. So, um, you know, I just wanted to thank all of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Chief, I was just going to ask a, a, a the question you had on, on the list, um, both a, a community survey and a survey of the offices th themselves, I remember that happening during the original study um, and it's listed as a not difficult thing. Um, you know, I'm just curious, you know, particularly with the police officer survey, I think doing that on a regular basis and, you know, including feedback, uh, uh, you know, I think is important. Uh, you know, getting feedback and 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 addressing the feedback um, from the offices themselves. Um, I, I'm not sure how much of that was done with the original survey when the original um, survey had been done. But I think uh, I think it might be different if it was done. Frankly, I think that, that that there might be different responses this time, and it might be worthwhile for us to perhaps do that sooner rather. Than yeah, I think um, I want to say uh, his recommendation uh, was that we did it every three years, or so, I'm pretty sure. Um, actually, me and Larry had just spoken about that recently. Yeah. 
Um, and I know Arlene, we've spoken about the police officer, not so much the community survey, but the police officer survey. And just like you said, Larry, pulling stuff out of there and, and you know, utilizing it in a way to, to make things better for everybody. So um, I definitely think it's very important, um, you know, and, and hopefully we can do the police officer survey again, you know, in the near future and just see what we can learn and pull from that to, you know, help move things forward and make things better for everybody. All right. I think it might be worthwhile not waiting three years for that particular survey, because as I said, I think um, to, to perhaps get a new one and address that one might be more worthwhile than going back to the older one that I, I think things might be a little bit different within the force at this point. We can look at it. I mean, you know, <clears throat> it, the, the, uh, the survey coincided with um, the changeover in the leadership in, in the chief position. So the, the timing, you know, if you do it too soon, I mean, you know, to Frank's credit, he's done a lot, but it also takes time to, to affect change, right? So, um, you know, I, I'm not saying we can't do it in two years instead of three years, but I think uh, we, we were all very anxious when we did those surveys, both the community survey and the internal survey, we were very anxious to compare the areas uh, that were maybe particularly weak and compare those with with uh, the new survey and see if there's been improvement. You know, and and I mean, we're looking forward to doing that. It's a great it's a great tool. I mean, if I if, if I was chief, I'd want to know that information. You know what I mean? That's the way we talked during the the police meetings that we had, uh, the committee meetings that you know. He's, he's anxious to know what the areas are that need improvement. So again, we can debate whether it's two years or three years, but I think um, we're looking forward to doing it. Anything else for Frank? Hey, so we got about two hours with Marianne, is that right? <laughs> yes. Very funny, very funny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that note, I think I'll make a motion to adjourn if I can have a second. Second. All in favor. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you all. All right, guys. Okay. Good, night. Good night. Thanks, Frank. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Frank. Bye -bye. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Good night. Good night, all. Thank you.